Yeah, because yeah, right now I, I didn't realize. Yeah, I was basically talking for like twelve minutes already. So. <laughs> Good. All right. So we're going to put off for a second. Yeah. As I said, I'll get back. To, uh, I'll get back Your to that. Just like answer. Massage on the ears, so we're not complaining. Oh, yeah. Sorry, what was that? <laughs> Your voice is like a massage on the ears, so we're not complaining. <laughs> Yeah, I will admit that was one thing, one of the weirdest things I ever had was uh, when I was teaching a fourth year class, uh, when I got the evaluations back, because of course you you rate your professor, you know, it's one where how do they do it? Generally, if you're an easy professor, you get good marks. If you're a hard professor, you get low marks, which is why we really don't look at it too much. But one thing that, I, that we often do is you take a look at the written comments, because that's where people have specific things of how you can improve your presentation. One year, somebody just said, you know, things that I could improve on sing the lecture and i'm just kind of going what I can so yeah but no that yeah that one actually happens all right so we'll get started on this but i'll just uh, just end off with with cell culture so hang on was, was that a pause or did it just cut out for me then i think it just cut out yeah, yeah. Okay. i thought you i thought you were saying things you can improve on and then nothing that's why ah. i laughed okay <laughs> there we are but yeah, so I said with uh, cell cultures, the key thing that we want to deal with is that we can't do mixed cell cultures. They're usually one tissue type. So you have muscle, you've got liver cells, you've got cardiac cells in a plate. But once again, that's not a whole body. All right, so let's actually get this going. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you're located. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome. Uh, this is ENG050599, or as I've jokingly said, it, just Greg's good. <laughs> And we're here with the next discussion. Today, what we're going to be doing, and yeah, this is something cutting, where... That's cutting out there for me. Um, hang on. Oh. Let me... Okay. Uh, so today, the topic I went out and asked in the community, what was it that you people wanted to look at next? And babies was the big one. So what we're going to be doing today is the next generation. From right at the start of conception to adulthood, how is something like Zootopia, a society with hundreds of sentient species, every imaginable body type you can imagine. What are the costs and the effects of that? And just to start with, I mean, when we take a look at, you know, our society, once again, we're really limited in the fact that regardless of whether you're dealing with the cultural as aspects of things, things like theological elements, uh, overall, just societal levels, when you break it down, we're all still human. And just look at how varied things like childhood development and education are handled across the world. It's actually a huge difference. Each culture has almost completely different uh, expectations and levels that they expect the students to perform in. Uh, probably one of the more famous one of these is, of course, uh, when we compare something like early childhood education going right up into uh, high school between something like the U.S. and Canada, and then somewhere like China, where what we see is that in China, Holy cow, is it cutthroat? Uh, I don't know if anybody is familiar, but for instance, uh, in order to get into a, everyone can get into a primary school. No problem there. However, if you want your uh, child to get into the good uh, high school or good high school, they better do well on a standardized test. And after that test, I don't remember what it's called, but the main entrance exam for China is considered to be like one of the widow makers of the society. There are just, it is so stressful because it, it quite literally is. There's one test will determine what you're going to be able to do with your life. Because if you don't do well, if you don't get into the university that you want to with the program of your choice, guess what? Your life plans just got changed. So there's a whole lot of emphasis worked around at early stages in order to do these types of developments. And that's just, these, once again, this is just cultural differences. This isn't dealing with biological differences. What it is, is just how societies value these things. And when we look at Zootopia, of course, holy cow, do things get different? Because, once again, even just think of how you can perceive the world. If you are, you know, a 10 centimeter tall mouse, literally how you see the world is going to be different than a giraffe. Your perception of everything involved in it, how you interact with it, all of these things are going to be completely different. So... When we see that, you start to notice that, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, just whoever is uh, uh, chewing right now, could you mind muting? <laughs> sorry, that's me. Um, okay. As I, as I said, I was still, I'll move my laptop away. So, um. Oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> just hearing that in the background is kind of like, Ooh. all right, so let me just take a look. But yeah, so when we're dealing with that, 
there are so many additional factors that go into this. But to start with, I think what we're going to do is I'm just going to go through one of the biggest differences that we see in how various animals, how these things can actually go through and you know, how do you manage to, as I said, how do you beat the reaper? How is it that you ensure that your genes are the ones that are passed down for your young to be able to succeed into the next generation, keep things going? And what we come up with is there's two overall strategies. And think of this as a spectrum where you're very rarely going to find animals that completely exemplify one or another. But what we call it is RK selective theory. And really what this is, is it's the old debate of quantity versus quality. So when we look at uh, our selected species, they're generally small, uh, small species, short lifespans, fast time from birth to maturity, really high reproductive rates, whether they have uh, a large number in each litter or simply lots of litters in order to produce young. But when we look at the energy expenditure of this, and this is one thing where it doesn't matter what strategy you're using, raising children takes a lot of energy, both in terms of actually just having them, uh, you know, from conception, them developing anatomically, physiologically, but also after the fact, the amount of work that goes into actually helping them to grow, helping them move, either uh, depending on the species, whether or not the uh, parenting is hands off or hands on, as it were. But all of that factors into it. So with these R-type selections, and this is only where, and I'll get to this where, you know, basically a uh, bunny bird was literally a nightmare situation, but we will get to that where, so like rabbits. Uh, has anybody ever found a rabbit nest in their yard or anything like that? No. Where, no. No. basically, rabbits, when they give birth, a lot of times, it's just going to be out in the middle of a field. Quite literally, the nest is a combination of fur, grass, something, all this basically managed to get together. And then, so the female uh, has her kits, and then she leaves. <laughs> she basically, rabbits, they feed their young either just once or twice a day. So mother goes out, she forages, she comes back, she spends like 15 minutes feeding her kits, and she's gone again. And that continues until they're weaned. And this kind of exemplifies that how the rabbit philosophy works is they don't know, they really don't care about the individual. They just produce enough young so that even with an absolutely god awful attrition rate, they are able to survive. It's just, we've got the numbers, we do it. But once again, because they put so much energy into producing a lot of young in an individual litter, well, they actually have to go out and forage and do things because otherwise they themselves are going to be in trouble. And in this case with rabbits, of course, if you see this in the field, one of the most common things that people do, and it's wrong, is they assume that, oh, crap, the mothers abandoned them. And then they do things like take them inside and try to fix it. When in fact, no, that's just mum being normal. She would, she would have been come back either in the uh, dawn or dusk, would have fed them and moved on. Now, not always the case, but that's the most common. So what we see is, once again, this idea that these species, by and large, Everything is geared towards mature quick, have lots and lots of young, really don't give a damn about any of them. <laughs> Conversely. I think, I think something's rubbing against your mic in the background. Nope. Mm. Hang on. Let me just see if I can get this. All right. Let's try that. Uh, is this any better? Much yep. Better. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> so when we're dealing with the other side of the spectrum, K selection, what this is, this is quality. So you end up with animals where they don't produce a lot of young, but what they what would do is they invest in it. Everything from uh, how much growth occurs in utero, protection when, the, when they're born, they generally are raising, they might very well have a societal, you know, either a herd, something like that, where there's a lot of effort kept and uh, invested in making sure that every, you know, young that is healthy and, you know, all this other stuff, that they have a good, a good chance to go. And what we see here is, this is of course humans, a lot of large animals where we're dealing with things like elephants, uh, usually things like horses, ungulates, all those, you're dealing with animals that have long gestation periods, long periods of time between where they are born and they reach sexual maturity. But also, 
you know, it's the one where they are basically, as I said, the question is, do you put all your eggs in one basket or do you buy a lot of baskets? And then, you know, just don't fill them up all the way. Uh, and obviously, the issue here is that it's a trade-off. It's all based on energy. So as a result, what you need to have is this idea of just what strategy works. And for large mammals, this is actually kind of a double-edged sword. Because if we take a look between the R and the K, as said, one of the biggest issues is in litter size. Where, as I said, with rabbits, they produce a whole lot of young. Well, if you're a big animal, and if we actually look at how the, uh, particularly something like the uterus scales with body size, what we actually see is, for something like an elephant, or in a human, they are not optimized for multiple births. Everything from when we have placentation, so how uh, the embryo uh, attaches to the uterine wall, to just a matter of space. In a lot of these creatures, multiple births are rare, and in the case of you know, something like where we have you know, uh, octomom and things like that, there are severe health concerns that can go along with that, just because from a body standpoint, from an energy standpoint, we did not evolve for that. So as a result, just because of their size and how big they have to get in order uh, before they're even born, that's once again, it slows things down. It makes it so that they can't just pop out additional uh, offspring. So they've got to invest in what they have. So, and once again, the difference there is, as we mentioned forward, like a rabbit, if she loses that entire litter, well, she can get pregnant again and have a whole other litter in a month. Oh, yeah. Rabbit gestation period is 30 days, about. A venom heart, um, rabbits usually have their litter in dens. They don't actually usually have them in fields. They do on occasion, but... Yeah, they it, in dens, so... Yeah, it depends on... Types of rabbit. Oh, rabbit. Yeah, so... But, I would say it depends on the species. Uh, around here, it's normally uh, the European cottontail that we usually have, and yeah, they just leave them... They just put them in the field. Now, also, uh, things like hares are well known for just leaving them out in the middle of a field. But yeah, it does vary just depending on where they are. And as I said, the idea of the complex warrens, once again, some rabbit species go through with that. And it actually, that's kind of interesting because, and we'll get to that in a bit, is once again, something that can change the dynamic of is it R or is it K type selection is the degree of integration of individuals. And that's because, so we've already gone through kind of the big example, something like a blue whale. It's going to produce one young. The gestation period is on the order of years. And it takes decades to reach, to reach sexual maturity, let alone adulthood. But now let's take a look because we see just based on things like lifespan, litter size, time to maturity. Uh, when we actually look at, oh, I'm sorry, gestation period as well. Uh, when we look at that, well, there are some animals that have elements of both. So if we take a look at, for instance, wolves, and this is a very common one. Well, dogs and wolves in general, they can have large litters. The time to maturity is pretty darn fast where they reach sexual maturity within about six to eight months. But then uh, they reach actual, they're only adolescents at that stage, but still they are mature within two years. So they have lots of litters. They can reduce it very quickly. They have a fast time to maturity. But wolves as a species are actually K-type instead of our type why because does every uh, wolf in the pack reproduce no it's is it just me you've cut out for or is it everyone uh, no, cut no, no that, 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 that was yeah, me i actually uh, my cat knocked my phone over so <laughs> cats not having any of your shit uh, basically, yes. Well, since I'm just sitting here, uh, she knows that I'm not paying attention to her, and now I must suffer for it. <laughs> uh, yeah. And as I said, the idea here is that, you know, no, not all wolves reproduce. Generally, at least for in particular, something like uh, timber wolves, the more commonly, uh, you know, the more commonly known pack animals, is generally there will be one breeding pair. So you have the, those individuals, they're giving birth to a comparatively large litter, but not everyone does it, and the whole pack actually is responsible for caring for the young. And this is actually really interesting because from a dynamic of something along the lines of wolves as opposed to, say, uh, big cats, so something like a pride of lions, they are completely opposites in what level of care non-related uh, 
mammals will give to the actual, uh, you know, to the young. So in wolves, what do we see is that you can even have instances where other females, even though they didn't mate, it can occasionally happen that they'll start lactating so they can actually help to feed the young, and they will. And of course, the entire pack is there for the protection of the young. Anyone tries anything, you could very well have a big group of uh, very, very large dogs who really don't like you. And as a result, this is an idea that they are investing in the development of these individuals. I was going now, to of say, course, we, yeah. sorry, I was going no, to say ahead. an interesting thing about leading on from that is the fact that humans, human females go through a menopause. They stop reproducing, mm -hmm. but live on. And I believe it's humans, killer whales and elephants are the only species which do that. And in all yes, cases, it is. And so the elder generation can look after their grandchildren. Yeah. And well, that's, that, that is absolutely true. And one issue is uh, it does have to do with just age, because let's face it, even though humans go through menopause, usually, you know, in about late 40s to 50s, sometimes even more. And of course, with hormone replacement therapy, you know, all bets are off. But what we do see is that yeah, it's a matter of just not living long enough. And this is something where in the wild, of course, uh, this is really interesting because if you look at most species, so like even foxes, wolves, their life expectancy, at least from an average standpoint, is ridiculously low. You know, we know for a fact that just by being domesticated and, you know, getting to avoid as much of the disease, starvation, and everything else that goes along with living in the wild, you actually have it where cats, dogs, them getting up to either you know, 20 years, it's not unheard of. In the wild, the odds are they're past their prime at you know, five to eight years, and the odds are they're not going to survive that long. So when we actually see that, we already can see that uh, the ability for them to develop menopause becomes very difficult. I actually think one, yeah, uh, there was some work that was being, you said on killer whales, but I think actually also in uh, right whales, as I read about that. But once again, that's just because you have these, these species that are capable of living long enough for it to become an issue. Uh, but once again, if we look back at what I mentioned before about the difference between a wolf pack and a lion pack, well, generally what happens in a lion or a lion pride is if another male takes over the pride, he kills every cub. Every last one of them. Why? That causes the females to go into season. He gets to then pass on his genes. So that's something that is completely different, even though they have a pack mentality. And for the adults, there's a degree of, you know, communal aspect where they help out each other. But on that reproductive level, for them, the priority is my genes first, and then they will go through and do this. So there's actually other species. You know, there are some weird ones. Uh, another one that was actually kind of odd is uh, zebras. You know what? Yeah. It's they're herd animals, not overly known for being like violent, psychotic, anything like that. But yeah, it's actually not unheard of for if a stallion takes over a herd for him to actually induce miscarriage in the females once again, so that then they will go into estrus sooner and then he'll be able to get his his offspring out of it. OK, so once again. That's just a really interesting difference. Uh, now, when we look at Zootopia, and this is something overall, what we found is as species become social, we see that there is a movement from the R-type selection to a K-type selection. Things just naturally move in that way because whenever you're living in a communal society, especially in one where you're sentient, a lot of those stressors, those events that would cause for there to be additional infant mortality or you know, even miscarriage, they're reduced. So as a result, the risk for being a K-type, a quality strategist, is much, much lower. So when we look at the film in Zootopia, what is it that we see? We actually covered this in also one of the previous elements. We see small family sizes. We don't see exceptionally, you know, we, except for Bunnyboro, and what's really neat is, of course, when we go to the city, it's that disparity where even other rodent species or once again, rabbits are not rodents, but you get my drift, where they seem to only have ones and twos, which is very normal. And we do see that, obviously, because we did see in the movie that there is communal education, 
there is a, a some type of safety net in place for others, not overly fair. And we do know that certain species are better than others in the terms of the law. But yeah, it's something where uh, as populations grow, as they move, what ends up happening is you move from an R type to a K type selection. Uh, that's actually good because once again, you're not dealing with a situation where you're going to stress the region. And we're dealing with actually any type of organism. There's a concept known as the carrying capacity. And this works whether you're dealing with humans, whether you're dealing with you know, people in cities, or if you're dealing with uh, populations of animals in the wild. The carrying capacity is a measure of how many individuals can an area support just in the resources that are there. So we're mainly dealing with food, water, shelter. And obviously, if you're dealing with an area where you suddenly the population exceeds the carrying capacity, well, then you have problems because either you need to lose individuals, once again, through death or migration. But those are actually your only options. Uh, so when you have the switch in society from an R to a K type, you do, you see this where they go away from numbers and they focus on the survivability of each of the each of the young. Uh, now, where things unfortunately become just a you know a little weird is, of course, we look at Bunnyboro. That is, from a biological perspective, it's Armageddon. I am not joking because we are dealing with famine and civilization collapse. Yeah. Basically, yes, because that population there, every okay, well, we don't know, but it's heavily implied that because Disney wanted to make the bunnies multiplying joke, rabbits have maintained from a litter size. They've maintained that R-type selection. Now, we know, fortunately, that there were at least some changes because that uh, time period between uh, birth until maturity still seems to be, you know, on the order of decades. And that's good because otherwise you have an R-type strategy, but a K-type society. So basically, you have a society where they're producing tons and tons of offspring, but they are also making sure and protecting them, helping to raise them, to educate them, to give them the best chance that they have. So, yeah, you're dealing with a situation there where the carrying capacity of a region would get hit really, really fast, especially when you take into account just how rapidly these R-type uh, selection strategies, how often they uh, do reproduce. I mentioned with rabbits previously in our world, 30 days for some species of rat or mice, it can be as low as 21. So within a month, you could actually have it where you have a full litter and once again, litter sizes with uh, rabbits or many rat species, the low end is usually like four or five. The upper end could be over a dozen. <laughs> so as a result, this creates a, a scenario where, yeah, you have, they're producing so many young that you're basically looking, you need the Hunger Games. You need to have you know, a battle royale, some type of event, you know, just to purge in order to make sure that the carrying capacity gets lower. Now, in modern society, <laughs> Got the oh, jeez. Okay, so Star Trek fight song. Got it. <laughs> Took me a second there. Um, but, but no, it is one thing where, uh, yeah, you are dealing with a scenario that that could be really, really bad. Uh, and really, the only option that they would have is, and this is same, the same thing that every uh, species goes through, and even every society, is as you develop technologically, the local carrying capacity ceases to be a big issue if you have a way of moving resources into an area. So with modern transport, things like that, I mean, let's face it, if you're in any type of a Western city, you know, the usual type of, you know, I'm not even talking big city. So more along the lines of, you know, big suburbia, because we just, you know, we actually, we were, it would be even worse in uh, the major cities, but in even something like a suburbia, where you do still have things like green space, uh, the population is not completely packed in to only one area. Well, what you end up having is that, uh, yeah, how many resources are available in an urban environment? You might have a community garden. Uh, there might be a local species of, say, you know, uh, either rodents or actually, well, depending on where you are, there might be lots of rodents. Uh, but once again, the ability to live off of the land, as it were, that's really freaking hard, <laughs> at least for a large population. Once again, if you were to have, you know, uh, go back to the idea of subsistence farming, you know, each family growing for themselves, it might be possible to do that 
in an urban setting, but overall the carrying capacity for a city is abysmal. So what do people do? We move the food to us. Because the only other option is you move to the food. So as a result of uh, you know, society developing, either transport, uh, just simple logistics, that local carrying capacity can be affected. But in the case of something like Bunnyburgo, when you consider that they give birth to a ridiculous number of young, within you know, a decade, those individuals can start having children. Of course, once again, uh, there's a question that Disney will never answer. What is the teenage pregnancy rate in Bunnyboro? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. <laughs> because, yeah, it's one where, because uh, once again, even if they are following the human norm, which is where, depending on your society, once again, where puberty can begin, usually it's about, I think right now, the, uh, the number is about 11 years, 10 to 11 years, but it has been trending lower recently. Uh, but yeah, if they start right when they're capable, you're dealing with a situation where you'll have exponential population growth so fast that, yeah, the local carrying capacity would be completely swamped within you know, a matter of only a few years. The um, joke of uh, buddies taking over the world would actually be a reasonable joke. They'll have no choice. Yeah, exactly. they, will quite let, they will have no choice. They will have to take over. They will have to be the cruel rulers. And who knows? Simply because of, once again, the idea of local carrying capacity, they might need to turn into, you know, uh, predators and just eat the other species. Because that's about all the only hope they're going to have. Yeah. So, yeah, once again, these are things that Disney is not going to cover, I don't think. We're not going to have, you know, the, as I said, the Battle Royale version for Zootopia 2. Or, yeah. even, you know, even, or even Thunderdome. I mean, yes. Two mammals enter, one mammal leaves. Oh, yeah, Ben and Hart did an interesting solution to all this, but let's not go there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> that's just something. Well, go ahead. Well, if, if, you, if you, especially if you're talking about bodies, then the dome thing would not work at all because it would not work for one while. That would take ages. Oh my god, yes. Yeah, and that's just you it. You have to do like Battle Royale, like 50 50 or something. Oh, yeah. Well, I said the reason why I, I originally called it the Hunger Games is because, of course, that's an annual thing. So, yeah. yes. You know, it's almost like, uh, does anybody here watch Rick, Rick and Morty? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, oh, of course, the when, they show, when, they go, when they go to the, the Purge planet, where, yeah, yes, this is a bad idea. idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's an awful idea, but at least it's amusing to watch. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, no, it's just, it is this idea of, yeah, basically, when you have us, and this is actually something that we do see this in human culture in the past. There have been times where when populations have come into conflict, that, yeah, for resources, there has been actual genocide wiping out entire cultures. Why? Because we want their stuff. And this isn't something that's, you know, in any one region. We actually see examples of it even in uh, Asia, Africa, South America. Um, I actually don't know if there would have been anything in North America. Uh, the indigenous peoples, their tribes were generally, they did you know, go to war with each other, but I don't know if there was ever um, like a wholesale slaughter of one group. Uh, I'm actually not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And then, yeah. of course, what we end up with there is, yeah, you got a situation where they ran out of resources. They needed to do something. And of course, there is an advantage to this because, and this is one something that's also very interesting when we look at the human side of it, is. When we have a situation or you know, any type of stressor that's on a population, that nurtures not only um, evolutionary development and adaptation just based on the new natural selective pressure, but also it brings up the idea of you actually, um, oh, sorry, again, my brain's just fried here. Uh, not only dealing with uh, selective pressure, you're dealing with societal pressure. So it's something where you can actually go in and it nurtures change. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. So it's this idea of, and when we take a look at human history, what is one of the biggest drivers of technological development? Getting back to, uh, you know, the Bronze Age, or even the Stone Age, really. War. Exactly. War. You are going to war with someone, I need to figure out a way to be able to kill that guy faster than he's going to kill me. But, at the same time also, I also need to figure out ways that if he does hurt me, I can get fixed. It's that whole idea of war and medicine go hand in hand. So when you actually have that type of stressor, 
it is a major advantage for having civilizations grow. And one very interesting thing that really only became known uh, since about the 1940s, I think, was when we started, uh, and this is something we're in the past, there people did first contact with uh, you know a native populations really really badly i mean just awful where of course when you're dealing with uh you know depending on the group they basically show up and then impose their beliefs on them thereby just completely destroying the native culture uh now there's there are still what are known as uncontacted peoples in the world sentinelese exactly i'm just gonna say the sentinelese uh natives which this is an island that this tribe has been on there for what we figure is about 60,000 years. So they have been there for a really long time. Of course, we can't actually go in and look to verify any of that because they are ridiculously violent towards outsiders. Uh, they weren't always the case, but in the last century they have been. But what's neat is when you look at their population has been maintained at or below the local carrying capacity. It's actually, it is a uh, tropical environment. Uh, jungle uh very very so it's nutrient rich there are animals there are natural plant species all of that is something that they can survive there and because their numbers have remained small what we see is and this is something that we have seen also throughout history is their development level stalled they stopped developing technology because they didn't need it and they have been effectively fixed at a paleolithic level of development. So we're talking Stone Age here for 60,000 years. Think about oh, with the rest. I was just going to say, you mentioned Stone Age. Yes. We, accident we accidentally bumped them up to the Iron Age as a ship. We did. Ran into the island. And then yeah, we harvesting it for iron. Yes, although once again, um, just as a note, when you're dealing with the distinction there of what level of technology society is at, uh, it's usually not determined by that they use a technology, it's that they can either build or produce the item involved. So the Central Leaf people are still considered to be as a Paleolithic Stone Age because they do not know how to actually uh, work iron. They don't know how to extract it from the rocks. Uh, they don't know how to do the forging techniques. And basically what they do is, yeah, they just take either a hunk of metal and just put it, you know, rub it on a rock in order to get an edge. That is the level that they are at. So for something like the idea is, of course, we start off with Bronze Age. Bronze is a mixture of uh, tin and copper. And when we figure out how to do that, suddenly, and that's, they develop ways of making that as well as using it. Now, of course, does anybody know why bronze occurs before iron in terms of development? So you're dealing with a, an amalgam metal as opposed to just a pure one? Uh. I think Nobly tried to guess it, it, and I think I heard it, and I'll try and agree with him. It's that it can be smelted at a lower temperature. Yeah, Bingo. Yeah, and that is it. Working with iron, it. yes, it is insane. Yeah. And when you, yeah, when you take that next stage of moving it up to steel production, holy cow. The energy requirements, like you need act what would be the equivalent of, um, in modern times, we use a blast furnace. But the same idea is there. You need to actually have a forge with bellows that you are forcing the heat to reach thousands of degrees in order to actually do that type of work. And that's why iron, what you normally find in uh, just uh, elemental iron out in rocks is, of course, it's hard, it's brittle, it's very difficult to work with. You need to get it melted down, get the impurities out in order to use it. And it takes way more effort and work in order to do it. So that's why bronze, cheap, easy to go. And this is actually something where we talked about this uh, during the food discussion for Zootopia. But yeah, in some ways, them having a mixed population, in particular, if the populations interact earlier. So once again, this idea of moving away from individual species to groups, a society that is supporting each other. Things like developing iron ore or iron technology, even bronze, might not have actually been a really driving factor for them for much longer than what it was for us. Why? Because do they need to develop metal for plows or anything like that when you could just have a large a large mammal do the job you know just with a piece of wood or stone anything That's like that point, yeah. exactly it's one where there's no need but it all depends on that idea of are they coming together as a society early or are they doing that late if it's early then yes we would see that and that could actually explain why and we talked about this with evolution where we look at the time frame 
the hardest part to explain of Zootopia is the whole everybody sentient. Because the last common ancestor for most mammalian species is in between 95 and 130 million years ago. And if we consider that humans as a species, well, we've only been around for you know, 100,000 to 1.2 million years, somewhere around there, the actual demarcation point for where we actually became homo sapiens as opposed to one of the other species. There's debate going on. And actually, I've been hearing some current ones where, uh, especially for the out of Africa theory, that we might have completely reworked that due to some of the uh, discoveries that have been made as to you know, where early humans started from and where they moved to more along the timing as well. So as a result of this, as you get that communal work, you then end up having where you can do things where large mammals can start working on either big tasks, things that require strength, things that require uh, just endurance or just size in general. But the small mammals can also be useful. Why? The odds are they're going to be able to uh, produce far smaller, uh, more precise equipment. Look at so you actually phones. have some... <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just imagine an elephant trying to fiddle with a cell phone versus oh, a mouse. God. Like... <laughs> no, no, that's one thing. We talked about this with technology. Um, even then, like horses, wow, did they get the short end of the stick? Because they are one of the ones kind of like, you know, the questions for Utopia that I have never been able to answer and I probably never will be because it's Disney magic. One, how the hell does the Night Heller toxin last so long? Yeah. And two, and two, why, like, what deity or, you know, overall force thought it would be so funny to have an intelligent society yet have uh, animals with a single hoof <laughs> as a digit? Isn't Night Heller let's face it. like other chemicals like, as shown in the lab? Like, uh, the problem there is, like, uh, we deal with into, so once again, it's slightly off topic, but the Nihiler serum, from a biochemical standpoint, the effects, that's something where you can figure it out. Basically, any type of a strong hallucinogen, along with um, some type of a big stimulant, and probably uh, something that's going to just induce a, even a fugue state. That is something where there are individual drugs that can do that. The problem is, and in particular for something like the stimulants, by and large, those are metabolized very quickly compared to other drugs. Like there are some, of course, that remain in the system for days. Oh, oh come on. Oh, she didn't. She knocked it off, but I think it's still here. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Good. Sorry. Sorry about that. But yeah, what we're dealing with there is that, yeah, it's just going to actually be really difficult to work with. There's an idea there that, uh, yeah, you really just have no idea what's going to happen. But with the Nighthaler toxin, it's the duration because something like the, uh, as I said, the stimulant, having enough of it to last for even like 24 hours. That is a lot. That's a lot. It would kill most species that would do that. And in particular, like we only see him, you know, filling the bowl. There's no mention if that is actually something that can be changed because something like that, that was, let's say, oh, I don't know, that was targeting a, you know, a Black Panther. Versus something like an otter, I can guarantee you the odds are that's going to kill the otter simply because the dose difference. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, with many of these things, it's something where uh, the hallucinogen, uh, you know, the psycho, uh, the psychoactive compounds that would basically be changing perception and how an animal reacts, those are easier because there's some of those that are very that have a high persistence, not months, but we're not dealing with like you know three to eight hours on the outside. And yeah, if you have taken you know, something like we take a look at individuals that are involved in, say, methamphetamine, where, yeah, you can, everybody knows they go kind of nuts, but then they crash hard. And the reason is because those are metabolized differently. And that's it. That's one of the only questions. The other one, horses, yeah, that doesn't really work. Okay, so. Yeah. All right. Actually, I have not been looking to see if there are any specific questions. Uh, I, was, I was just going to say about the horses that in one of the Zootopia discords, there was a piece of concept art posted back up. It's one of Officer Hops walking down this prison and you've got cells in the background. Uh, hmm. I think some of you, have any of you seen that? Yeah. I saw that. Thank no, I, but, no, I haven't, but go ahead. Anyway, <laughs> I was going to say in the nearest cell, you can just about see the outline of something with pointy ears, so a cat or a fox. But the right. main thing in that cell, its head... Whenever I look at it, it reminds me of a horse as it's got a pink ah. bit coming down and nostrils. It, the head really looks like a horse. 
But there are two big arms on the plexiglass wall, and they look like bear claws. <laughs> so maybe they were planning something in the concept art, but just decided to go for hooves later on. I'm not exactly. sure. Well, that's true. I mean, as I said, right now, it is just an issue where I've, I've joked in the past, and I think I even made that comment in you know the fanfic Lost Causes of Broken Dream, but the individual that invented double-sided tape was probably one of the richest individuals in their society. Because if you look at how do you grasp with hooves, you can't. All you can do is to kind of you know, match things together and go. And once again, that horse at the press conference, how he's managing to even hit the trigger on uh, the camera or the shutter on the camera, I have no idea. <laughs> but yeah, this is one of the ones where we do see that these type of adaptations, these movements, they do affect survivability. And as you get a more inclusive society, what you end up with is uh, a situation where, yep, things are moving towards communal living. We have mutual protection and education for the kids. We don't need to be squeezing out, you know, a litter every six months. That never work. Hell, in the case of rabbits, it's several. It's only like one every two months, I think, depending on where you're located. So that's kind of the big theory, but. Mammals don't all uh, <laughs> undergo pregnancy. At, I, was, um, I was thinking of mentioning oh, that, Julius, but you oh, sorry. do it. I was looking at that. Hang on. Oops. There we go. Ah, yes. Yeah. Oh, God, yes. That old okay, comic. Yeah, that's uh, that would actually make more sense. Having Hold some on. type of cybernetics here. Yeah. He did, although then again, Bogo. When you see Bogo ha having yeah. the what's it called, his uh, yeah. docket or whatever, you do see like some type of fingery. Yeah, he's got three digits. digits. Yeah. Yes. So he he's one of the uh, so technically uh, with him, any of the even toed ungulates, they would be fine, and those are things like water. So things with cloven hooves is the idea. So as a result, they would actually still be able to grasp. But when you actually take a look at the skeletal structure of mammals with the single hoof, so we're dealing here with mainly the equines, things in that area, yeah, they don't have, even their skeleton um, has basically lost. The remaining digits are vestigial. There's, I think, uh, one... A little, these... uh, well, there's a little knob, some a bit of the way up the leg, which... Yeah. It just sticks out. Yeah, exactly. And that is exactly what would happen is uh, they just didn't need it. And obviously the structural adaptation that they have is those limbs are really strong, able to absorb a lot of impact, which is good because uh, let's face it. Yeah. Something goes wrong. It's catastrophic. Normally you end up putting a horse down if it doesn't like break its leg uh, simply because the damage is so severe. But yeah, their skeleton, it has had adaptations. And we actually look at this. We'll get into that type of biological adaptation shortly. But what is mentioning before is, so if we look at, we've already gone through, you've had conception has occurred. The next step is, of course, you have to get that embryo implanted into the uterus. But things can't be easy. Uh, if we look at how does that happen in mammals, there's three main types of ways that it can work. And the differentiation is, if you consider, uh, so we look at the embryo, uh, the placenta surrounds the, uh, the fetus, there is the amniotic sac in there, and that attaches to the uterine wall. But the degree that it actually integrates, whether it's quite literally just, uh, you have the two membranes are touching each other, or they actually do kind of integrate and get uh, intermixing with the vasculature. It all varies depending on species. So if we actually look at um, the one that's found in most ungulates, uh, this is actually a very cool one. Uh, what we call that is uh, epiheliochoral placentation. And what that is, is quite literally the membranes for both the uterus and the placenta, they are distinct. Quite literally, uh, the placenta is, they're just basically small crypts on the inside, which are uh, cellular features. Think like the mountains and valleys type of effect where the membranes, that's all that they're contacting with. The two membranes kind of fit together, but the bond is minimal. This actually has advantages and disadvantages. Advantage is that the risk to the mother is greatly reduced. Why? Since that vasculature is not exposed directly, if something goes wrong, the odds are you're not going to have massive hemorrhaging. Uh, also, and once again, this depends on the idea of uh, survivability, 
But some species of ungulates in particular, if they get stressed, they can spontaneously abort. Where something where the conditions aren't right, you know, I started to raise this, uh, this fawn, but unfortunately the, you know, food, anything isn't there. They do have the ability, and once again, I actually, there has been enough research done to say if there is a conscious effort or if it's just something where, yeah, when things get uh, rough, the body just automatically takes care of it. But because that placenta has such a loose affiliation with the uterine wall, they can just get rid of their offspring if they don't want them. Kind of crazy. Of course, another issue with a weakness is uh, this is very rare, mainly because we look at the size of the animals that are involved here. They're generally mid to large size animals. But if they were to undergo, uh, you know, something like blunt force trauma, you can still have that slippage occur between the placenta and the uterine wall. And of course, when that happens, why does that connection exist? You have to get nutrients and oxygen from the mother to the fetus. Otherwise, bad things happen. So if you do have something where you have this very loose association, yes, that means that it does help for when you're handling the birth. It does help if you want to be able to expel or end the pregnancy at a later point. But if you're dealing with something that uh, that connection, because it is so tenuous, that also means there's more tissue in between the mother's bloodstream and the fetal bloodstream. That means that it takes longer in order for nutrients to fuse across. But in addition to that, it also means that the rate at which this happens is slower. And this is also once again a reason. If we think of most of the mammals that make use of that type of placentation, they're big mammals. They have one young at a time. Twins are rare. Triplets are really rare. And in the case of like horses, I actually don't know if there's ever been anything more than triplets. But once again, this is an idea of just because of the nutrient requirements, the simple ability of the, the nutrients and oxygen to, try to go across the barrier into the placenta, into the fetus, they're limited. Now, if we go up the stage and we have something a little bit, you know, a bit more uh, type of integration where you have uh, endothelial placentation. And in that case, so... As opposed to just being in contact, now what you have is that placenta is able to actually integrate a bit more into the uterine wall. And it actually now comes into contact with the, um, the vessels themselves. So there's physical contact between the blood vessels and the placenta. So you're dealing with a much, much shorter distance. You can have more nutrients crossing over. It also means that the fetus is more tightly associated with the uterus. And what we do see in this is this is a lot of the carnivores. So basically the entire order, dogs, cats, uh, they all fall under this group. And once again, it's kind of a happy middle ground because the risks are raised for the mother. If something does go wrong and you can have damage to that vasculature, you can have hemorrhaging. And of course, in the wild, really bad. But it's not as bad as for the next group, which includes humans. Uh, but what this does mean is that because you can more efficiently transfer stuff between the mother and the fetus, you can actually have more, uh, of, you know, larger numbers in the pregnancy. You're better able to transport the nutrients. Therefore, you can actually have more of them there. Now, we actually get into the final one. This one's really interesting, but also there's a reason where uh, this is kind of a sad statistic. But if anyone doesn't know this, pregnancy and childbirth is still one of the most dangerous things that a female will go through. When we look at the mortality rates, they have gone way down. But if you look at almost every other metric, it's still a huge risk. And one of the reasons is because uh, the type of placentation that humans use, as well as most rodents, is uh, hemiochoral placentation. And in this case, it's not just the vascular wall that's interacting with, it's actually directly coming into contact with the maternal blood supply. So you're actually dealing with something where you can have great transfer, absolutely amazing. The fetus is tightly associated with the uterine wall. And as a result, you can have incredibly efficient and stable uh, effects. However, if something goes wrong, it can go catastrophically long very, very quickly. Um, one of the ones that is like the scariest is something called a placental accrete. What this happens is if that placenta, as opposed to you know, just 
makes that connection, uh, but only on the outer, you know, kind of the outer and middle layer of the uterine wall. And if it goes deeper than that, though, now you're dealing with a situation where that's the major source of the vasculature. That's a lot of vessels. And what, of course, happens when uh, a female gives birth? That placenta gets expelled after the fact. And if that placenta was the only thing keeping those blood vessels from leaking, you can see the problem. This is a situation where if it happens, you can have a female crash and bleed out within a matter of minutes. As a matter of fact, when this normally happens, if they can detect it early in pregnancy, there are steps they can do to mitigate it. But a lot of times they have to go in, do a cesarean section and a radical hysterectomy simply because the risk is so huge. And it is something where it's incredibly dangerous. There are things that can go so wrong. It's not funny, but it is something where once again, advantages, disadvantages. And this is also what we look at. It's kind of interesting because this is one where we see that you actually have both. You have both R and K reproductive strategies. Um, and once again, it is just a risk reward. But for humans, yeah, the issue is very much that, you know, it's one where we have small numbers of births, but we're K type. We expose a lot of resources toward things. And just so happens that from an evolutionary standpoint, yeah, well, the biology's kind of worked out that there's a lot of things that can go wrong and there are a lot of risks that can be involved for females uh, that are pregnant. And even in first world societies, so we're dealing with, you know, G7 countries, these are technologically advanced. They generally have some form of, you know, healthcare support systems. When we actually look, there are still, and once again, this has improved immensely, but I think the number is about, you know, the average is about, uh, let me see here. Yeah, about, you know, seven deaths per 100,000 individuals. That's really low. Uh, considering that back going even to the 1950s and earlier, it was close to a thousand death per live birth. So 1% of women are just going to die in childbirth. <laughs> Not good. Uh, what we do see is a modern society, of course, with modern techniques, uh, surgical techniques, diagnostic techniques, that levels drop down. And now, as I said, for worldwide, at least for the G7 countries, it's about seven. Uh, this is actually one that's, and I'm, you know, don't mean to, don't mean to rag on the Americans, but they are the only country that's actually gotten worse in recent years. Uh, now, now of course, I don't have data for like 2016, but from 2015 and on, uh, it actually went up from 12 to 14 deaths per 100,000. And they are the only developed nation that that happened for. I don't know why, but that's a little worrying. <laughs> I mean, so, yeah. You could, uh, you, could argue, you could argue a lot of things, but I think that would go off topic a lot. So. Oh, no, no we, yeah. we are not going to go there. But obviously, yeah. when you're dealing with something like Zootopia, well, we've got examples of all three types of placentation. So we think about the logistics of just prenatal care delivery. All of that is something that have to, would have to be known. And this is why, you know, any mammal in their society that actually manages to become a, you know, a vet doctor, whatever you want to refer to them as, depending on their area of specialization, they would have to be aware of all of this. And, you know, we've talked about this before with uh, public health, but just think that probably one of the most stressful jobs there is to be a pharmacist because knowing how the medication is going to affect or interact with other medications in such a wide range of species? Nightmare. <laughs> I mean, but no, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, yes, that would be a nightmare. But then again, I think that would be whilst a horror, a nightmare. I think it'd be one of the most interesting jobs to have at the same time. Oh, absolutely, and it's one thing. Well, you know, once I'm a research scientist, believe me, my job is absolutely fascinating. Uh, based on the stats, I am decreasing my life expectancy by approximately a decade just because of the materials that I have to deal with. But <laughs> it's so interesting. So yeah. that's something where it's once again risk reward. Yeah. Uh, okay, we do have a question here. So, Merck Martin. Uh, Rabbits are actually interesting. Some species do, some species don't. And it's actually more seen in hares than it is in rabbits. Uh, as a matter of fact, hares are one of the few species that you could actually have two pregnancies occurring at once. Uh, this doesn't happen with rabbits, but uh, with rabbit species, it's only in hares. But one thing that's different when we look at reproduction for rabbits is the fact that they do not actually have a, uh, basically a standardized estrus period. Uh, they don't go through ovulation on based on a date basis with them. Uh, when they mate, they ovulate. So as a result, 
it's something that could happen where if a rabbit were to go through and mate with or or the hair, sorry, would mate with uh, one male, and then you know, it can't be a huge difference. But let's say three to five days later, they mate again. They can actually have two sets of embryos present uh, that are from two completely different, uh, you know, uh, male contributors, but also they're from two different times. So the issue there is if there's a big gap between them, of course, it doesn't work out well for that second litter, because when the female does go into labor, she doesn't just expel the first litter. She expels them both. And when you're dealing with an animal that only has a 30 day gestation period, each day is really important from a developmental standpoint. I was just going to say, I just need to run now, so I'll come back in a bit, but could you oh, perfect. Me in when I come back? It should be only oh, five perfect. minutes. Thank you very much. All right, so just uh, before we move on again and just uh, talk about, are there any questions that people just have? I haven't exactly been looking here. Yeah, super fun, uh, super fecundancy is, yes, that's what it's called, and oh yeah, uh, it's rare. Uh, it actually has, ha interestingly enough, oh, well, I wish I could remember where it was. It was a journal article. Well, not really a journal article. It was a case study from 1985. This actually happened in a human. Really? Uh, yes, it did. Huh? Yes, it, did. It, it, had, it happened once. At least that's what I've had. Uh, with the advent, in particular, and with the use of um, fertility drugs, it's becoming more common for that to happen because you can't actually have uh, implantation occur at different times. But yeah, it's something that it's only happened in humans very, very rarely. Uh, and really, really, when you think about it, it makes sense. Um, during each stage of pregnancy, particularly after uh, implantation, you do have a big change in the hormonal levels that are occurring. So that's going to change how the embryo can interact with the, with the urine wall. And it's the same idea where, you know, there are things that are in place from an evolutionary standpoint to stop something like that from happening. Or in the case of fertilization, of course, what happens? Well, as soon as a sperm manages to make its way through uh, the membrane of the egg, suddenly there's a huge calcium wave, which is a signal that's sent out in the cell. It actually changes that outer membrane and causes it so that any other sperm that come into contact, they can't get through. So that way you don't end up with having multiple uh, sperm cells fertilizing an egg because that can lead to just really bad things. Once again, uh, when we're dealing with genomes, at least of animal species, the vast majority of them, they're diploid. They've got two copies of each chromosome. One came from the mother, one came from the father. And when we look at uh, regulation of genes, they're kind of optimized for having that two copies and no more. So when you do have something occur where you end up with either uh, trisomy, so three genomes, or if you have what's known as a polyploid event, which is where you can either have a natural just doubling of the number of chromosomes, or... Uh, you can actually have, and this is more common in plants, what's known as an allopolyploid, which you have two different individuals or two different species that get together, but the embryo that's formed has the complete genetic makeup of both parents. So they end up being tetraploids. In, human, or in mammals, that usually causes it to be uh, embryo lethal. Uh, anytime that you have the wrong copy number of chromosomes, one thing that it does is it makes reproduction basically impossible. The other thing is, of course, that regulatory level, especially during uh, embryogenesis, so the development of the embryo of the fetus, there are many checkpoints that occur throughout the lifespan because, as I mentioned earlier, pregnancy is a huge metabolic load. It's a lot of energy, and mammals, and actually every animal, has come up with interesting techniques to not waste. <coughs> so if when an embryo is developing, something doesn't work properly, it makes more sense to actually either abort, degenerate, break that one down, try again. And that is actually something that we see. But once again, it's just all this idea of a trade-off. All right, so let's see. Any other questions? Yeah, but as I said, but something like that, you know, multiple pregnancies, it really is something that only occurs uh, due to fertility treatments, something that we've essentially induced it ourselves. And yeah, the idea is these embryos, you have checkpoints and they don't want to waste energy in case actually in some species, for instance, um, a lot of pigs. What's really interesting is through evolutionary pressure, they have actually developed. And this is something where uh, I don't know if it's been maintained in the domestic pigs. But at least in the terms of wild boars and the like, if there aren't enough fetuses 
in a litter. So if there aren't enough individuals in the uterus, the pig will spontaneously abort because it's not worth their while to only raise a small number of offspring. They actually need to have uh, those numbers present. And how it works is, of course, when an embryo does implant, it sends signals, it releases hormones into the surrounding area. If those hormone levels don't reach a high enough level, forget it. Break it off. We're done. We're going to try again. So obviously with the, uh, you know, in our, in the case of something like, um, you know, animal husbandry, things along those lines, it's something that uh, we can now make this that that doesn't happen. So you can use supplemental hormones, anything like that. And sometimes that is used depends on, you know, what you're, what you're actually raising the animals for. Cause, and this is one thing where philosophical difference between me and a friend of mine, who's a veterinarian, he's a large animal vet. And uh, so he deals with agriculture is, Oh yeah. For them, it's always, it's going to cost me this much to fix. I'll get this much out of the animal when it's either slaughtered, sold, bred, whatever. And if those numbers aren't, you know, the right, aren't the right combination. Nope. Get rid of it. So yeah, not exactly my philosophy, but it is something that's there. And it does just show that once again, we're dealing with it's situations here where child rearing from the get go, it is an immense load. It's an immense stress. Uh, when you actually look in terms of mammalian females, not just humans, but there's a whole raft of, you know, warning signs that can basically occur with these. You can have high blood pressure. You can have eclampsia. You can actually have uh, hemolytic incompatibility, which is where, and this is actually kind of crazy, is that um, the mother can actually produce antibodies against her offspring, particularly uh, if there's a RH incompatibility. So uh, when we're dealing with blood types, there are surface markers on the red blood cells. And depending on which markers you have, that determines if you're A, B, uh, A, B, or O. And of course, there's the RH, uh, positive and negative. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, that actually brings me one question, come to think of it. Because yeah. you were speaking of the three different uh, methods of, well, methods, quote-unquote, gestation with the umbilical cord, yada, yada, yada. Yep, yep. And I'm thinking, would the, I mean, I, I presume yes, but how much would the, uh, how much would the blood type difference, and I forgot the name, where the R1 neg R negative, R positive. Yeah, RH, RH that actually, negative. That's the one. Uh, <laughs> how much would that actually matter for the diff for the different, uh, well, call it methods of gestation? Because I feel right. that, uh, wouldn't it be that, again, this is me assuming, but wouldn't it be that be with the different connections, it would have different and or less effects on the embryo as regards to the mother? Yeah, and absolutely, that is true. Uh, one thing that you always want to remember is, regardless of how uh, the placenta is associated with the uterine wall, there is actually some cell transfer that goes on. So you end up with some fetal cells end up in the mother, some of the mother cells end up in the fetus. But the issue there is, when we're talking about blood type, is yes, if you have an RH positive fetus, an RH negative mother, that's yeah. probably going to cause a problem. And once again, in humans, we've got the worst of it because that blood supply is directly in contact with the fetal tissue. So that's why it's particularly bad. Also, <clears throat> when it comes to um, immunology, so we're actually dealing with the immune systems of mammals. In humans, if you are blood type O, from the get-go, from the moment that your immune system starts working, you actually have antibodies against the A and the B antigens. Yeah. So from birth, if you come into contact with that, you're going to have a non, you know, basically a non-host reaction which can be bad, lethal in fact. However, that's not the case for all mammalian species. And that's a really good thing for some of them uh, because when we look at this, so something like, for instance, a horse, there are, although there's only, I think about five main blood types, there are actually, if you look at the number of different antigens that are possible, and once again, there's, you know, we have the surface markers, you have the RH markers, and you also have any other type of surface marker can act as a trigger or a target for an, uh, an antibody. Yeah. In horses, there's over 400,000 possible blood types. Can you imagine trying to keep track of that? You know, keep yeah, track of horses. Yeah, it, it's crazy. But the key thing is, though, they don't have antibodies against the other blood types from the get go. What that means is the first blood transfusion that they receive, they can take it from any horse. However, then they will be sensitized to that. And if you were to give any of those, uh, so if you're dealing with another transfusion, if the blood has any of the markers that were in that previous one, you're going to get a, uh, an immune response immediately. 
And that's actually the case for the vast majority of mammalian species. We're a bit on the odd side because we do have antibodies against them. But for most things, this is actually the case for um, the mammalian uh, immune system as a whole, is the fact that it doesn't develop uh, antibodies until it comes into contact with the pathogen. And that's actually something that's key. And it's different for, say, you know, if we're dealing with plants. Plants are completely different yeah, because plants, you could have something similar where they call them resistance genes, R genes. Same idea as an antibody that normally what they're doing is they're looking for specific markers associated with either bacterial or viral pathogens. And then when they detect it, they cause a series of downstream reactions that help prevent and block the spread of the disease into the, into the surrounding tissue. Well, the thing, though, is it is not a... Uh, Go back. Sorry. Uh, with them, they don't have an adaptive immune system. Those R genes, whatever they received from their parents, even allowing for recombination events to occur, which those genes, you do tend to have them in clusters. So you can have things where they get mixed and match, the parts change. Whatever that embryo has, when it formed, that is the end all and be all of its disease resistance. Everything that it is resistant for is there. And it doesn't matter what it comes into contact with as throughout its lifespan, if it doesn't match what it's all what is in its genome, it's got nothing. Mam mammals, we have an immune system that on the good side, if it is a disease that you know we've come in contact with before, we can mount an incredibly fast response. However, that first time that you come into contact with a disease, then you're gonna be getting the full sick. Yeah, you're gonna be getting the full effects. And of course, for some of these. Yeah, you don't have five days for your immune system to actually go through, find and you know identify the antigen, develop or you know have an antibody against it, and get that into the system. So there's there are merits and there are flaws, and that's just how things work. All right. So just before we move on now, because now we've kind of covered just some really basic ideas. Let's just see. Uh, yep. So once again, the question uh, we will be getting into hybrids before, and just for anyone that's. Uh, joining us that haven't, hasn't been on one of these before, I'd encourage you to look up at the pinned messages because we do, in fact, have uh, links for each of the previous science discussions, at least for uh, over on Reddit. So you can actually take a look at some of these. But yes, in the case of hybrids, the question here is, you know, uh, if the genetic divergence is similar to... Sorry, what was that? Oh, I thought I heard somebody. No. Never mind. Okay. So if we are dealing with, you know, this type of population, this type of group. Uh, oh, what's this? So with these hybrids, if the genetic divergence is similar to what in our world is, yeah, only narrow pos pairings are possible. Generally, they have to be within a genus. Uh, and even then, they generally have to be close within the species. There's a bunch of reasons for this. But the main one is just, and I've mentioned this before, is think of a genome as a cookbook. It tells you, it has instructions for how do you build a mammal. That's what it encodes. And if you take a look at another individual of the same species, there will be small changes in the recipes that make it up, but it's still in the same order. And so when you look at position on a chromosome or a chapter in a book, the genes are in the same place. And part of reproductive, uh, you know, sexual reproduction is something called homologous recombination. What this is, is when the gametes are formed in meiosis, you can have where, once again, two copies of each chromosome, they can swap entire arms of the chromosome. So if you want to get, if you take a look at the uh, chromosome, you think of the big X uh, kind of shape to it. They can actually have entire long arms or short arms of the chromosome switch between those chromosomes. And if you have two species that are very closely related, you know, same species, basically, all of the instructions for how to build that mammal are probably going to be in and around the same place. So if you swap an area, what you gained uh, for one, you gave, you, know, you gave your version up to the other individual. In different species, though, they've undergone different evolutionary pressures, and as a result, the order of those chapters can change. So what you can up with there is, as opposed to when you have this homologous recombination occur, where you still have all the genes that are required for an organism to grow, to regulate itself, if the species are different, if those chapters are out of order, you can suddenly have that, oops, you lost a gene that was in that area because it was in a completely different location on the other individual. And as a result, yeah, you basically end up, uh, yeah, with a, an embryo lethal effect. It's the most common one that we see. And once again, dealing with 
this idea of going back to the idea that raising children is a big, big energy sink. And that's why at multiple stages throughout embryogenesis, there are checkpoints that if things aren't working, the embryo will, you know, depending on what stage it is, you can either just have it get reabsorbed, uh, it can go through and have a miscarriage, but they are saying something's wrong. We don't want to keep it this way. It's not worth uh, the energy expenditure. And yeah, not pleasant to think about, but once again, uh, this is actually a you know, random factoid. About 40% of human pregnancies uh, end before the female even knows that she's pregnant. It's just those initial uh, developmental stages. And when you actually look at embryo development in mammals, the first few uh, divisions are very highly coordinated and the structures that they form become absolutely essential for the development of the embryo overall. So if anything goes wrong there, you have a cell that either doesn't uh, replicate properly or what happens is um, if the DNA is damaged in the process, something you know, is occurring, the embryo will just be reabsorbed, try it again. And that actually happens most of the time when you're the same species, not most of the time, but, you know, 40% of the time when you're the same species. As soon as you factor in, multiple species all bets are off because you can actually have an instance where uh so as i said uh we want to deal with the successful hybrid in north america look to the koi wolf the coyote wolf hybrid why because most uh domestic dogs as well as many of the canis species in general so even some of the wild dogs they are all genetically compatible 78 chromosomes uh they have, you know, basically all the information in the same place. This is mainly, once again, when you're dealing with a, you know, how to build a mammal, you can have also the same ingredients that are involved, but different amounts of it. So you can have changes. That's why we can have this wide range of phenotypes where you can actually then have, you know, a bunch of things, but all the information, it's compatible. When we look at a broader cross, however, suddenly that's not the case anymore. So if you're dealing with something where, I won't say this is the example that I've often used is yes, so many people in the fandom, we want funnies to be there. We want the fox <laughs> rabbit hybrids. Let's be honest. However, when you look at that, you look at the differences and the, um, the ways and how those two animals, those instruction manuals, the, uh, the ways how they say that you want to build this mammal, they are completely incompatible. They are trying to build two different animals as a result. So what you end up with is, and in fact, in this case, um, they're so different that even the uh, embryo fusion with the sperm is impossible. The sperm cell from either of the species quite simply doesn't recognize that as an egg that can fertilize. They're different, the chemical signatures that are there, the surface molecules that are involved in the process, they're all different. So this is why hybrids, um, I would love to have them, but it's rare, but yes, the question here was that, um, you know, with, you're dealing with hybrid uh, relationships, it's something like Zootopia. How accepted would they be? I've got a little bit at the end of this. Uh, I wouldn't recommend people go take a look at the uh, hybrid talk as well. But yeah, at that stage, we're almost dealing with a societal issue. You know, these type of relationships between broad species and this idea of actually raising children as well. There are obvious analogs for humans when we're dealing with the racial issues, where, of course, in the past, uh, unfortunately, not that far in the past when you really think about it, something like a mixed race couple was considered to be just a complete and total affront. It was, you know, against God, whatever you want to view it as. Society didn't like it. Um, but yeah, something like that could still very well exist. We know that in Zootopia, species-level prejudice does exist. How much of that uh, actually factors through into what things would happen for hybrids? Not sure. And as I said, we'll get to that in a bit later. But right now, let's take a look at uh, the actual things like gestation period. Uh oh, lost oh, something here. Ah, oh, there we go. So, I mentioned earlier, what is one of the weirdest things about human pregnancy? Uh, now, does anybody know, in addition to what I mentioned before, of uh, size wise, does anybody here know why humans give birth to an effectively a premature offspring? Well, I knew before, but I also read through your Reddit post, so ah. it would be good for me <laughs> to say. Yeah, so there's ones where, as I mentioned before, what happens is, uh, due to the size of mainly our heads uh, and the brains that are associated with it, that's exactly right, is it is not possible for a human female to carry and give birth to uh, 
an animal that, or to a, a baby that would be at a similar developmental level to what we see in, say, chimpanzees. In reality, if we were to use that as the metric for how long a pregnancy should be, human pregnancies should not be nine months long. They should be like 18 to 20. And I don't think I know a single woman who I've ever talked with that would want something like that to happen. Um, and it's actually it's twofold. The head, because if you consider about it, our brains don't grow a whole lot. You know, it's something, if we look at the human bodies, almost all elements of it, they undergo some type of size increase. Uh, the brain doesn't go, compared to, you know, if you look at, at an infant's brain versus the adult, the size difference is nowhere near what we see for like any of the major muscle groups or any of the main skeletal features. So it's very much, that's your limit, and it's got to get out into the world. But once again, evolution has had, you know, it's a compromise. Because what are one of the other major changes that occurred in humans? Upright gait. We walk on two legs. That resulted in a narrowing of the pelvis, as well as uh, a narrowing of the birth canal itself. So quite literally... There is no way uh, to safely, other than a cesarean section, to give birth to a human that would be at that same developmental level. And once again, what I'm saying here is if we look at and compare like a chimpanzee at birth to a human at birth, it takes that human almost an extra full year to reach the same developmental stage that uh, that chimpanzee is at. And the whole reason is because the critical feature for us, our sentience, that idea of our brains we can't have it last that long. And if we look at Zootopia, what do we see? Every mammal's got an upright gait. And what that means is they are going to have something similar occurring. And in the case of some species, it could be immense. Uh, so for like an elephant, just think of the mass that is involved there and transferring that load from four limbs to two. You are going to need to have immense thickening of the long bones and the legs, the pelvis, the spine, possibly additional changes to the rib cage in order to assist in breathing. But all of those is going to make it so that giving birth is probably hard. So what we're going to end up with is a situation where uh, gestation time is very much in the wild. What we see is it's mainly dependent on body size. So how big the fetus is at the point of birth. Makes sense. Your animals with larger uh, you know, young, it takes them longer just to reach that stage. So what we're dealing with... Sorry, what was that? Uh, if you, okay, it's very difficult. Sorry. I just said we're getting a bit of feedback there. What? Okay, can you try that again? I just couldn't hear anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's my, uh, it's my bad. I thought it was you, but it was uh, my bad. Uh, so, so, yeah, and also. <laughs> So when we're dealing with something along those lines that, yes, what we expect to see is, so, and this is something where uh, the only comparison we really have is between uh, the difference between the, you know, uh, higher primates and humans. It's the only comparison we have for something like this. But what we would expect to see is not only would pregnancies in Zootopia last probably a bit longer, and I would almost say, you know, 30 to 50 percent longer just due to uh, the differences in, in developmental levels, the amount of energy, the size that are required, but also the young that would be given birth to would have the same problem in the fact that even though they were longer in development, they are going to be immature. We are probably going to be dealing with a situation where they go through and actually have a massive, you know, uh, just time period where they're not going to be able to move. If once again, this idea of human infants Everything is trying to kill them, and they are willing to let it happen. They have almost no defense, and something similar could be there. Whereas it feels like with something, uh, some species, many carnivore species, of course, the young are born with, you know, they're not fully functional. Mm. You know, the eyes aren't uh, open yet. Uh, even things like the musculature, it's still not there. But they're capable of movement uh, on their own. And, you know, even though it's not going to be the most coordinated thing, and it's one where, yes, I have made mistakes dealing with puppies in the past. I grew up with cats. I learned very quickly that you do not just, you know, take a puppy, put it halfway down, and then release it to the ground. They don't land on their feet. They just go right on their heads. So it's an idea of you know, coordination isn't all there. But when we look at uh, overall, it doesn't take them long to develop that. You know, the eyes are open within a matter of days. In the case of some of the ungulate species, the young is up and moving within a half hour of giving birth. With something like Zootopia, in particular, the changes that have occurred 
to the skeletal structure and the probable changes to the brain, there's got to be a, a similar movement there where you're actually having a situation that you have pregnancies that are ending early just because the females could not handle taking the embryo to that, to that end stage. Or, you know, best guess there. So, once again, this idea of this extended uh, developmental stage. Once again, this is indicative of a K-type population. Because of the necessity for this long juvenile period, the parents are responsible for the children for a much, much longer period of time. Obviously, during this case, and this is something where it does, it's um, not a universal trait in mammals. There's actually some where it's completely off. Uh, we do see one interesting difference or you know, between species is timing of pregnancies. And if we look at pregnancy species, as long as the female is nursing, they don't go into estrus. It's not universal. And I already mentioned things like rabbits, uh, horses, some other species where they will go into estrus very soon after pregnancy. So it's entirely possible with some of these species where you have a uh, female is nursing, one young is already pregnant with the next. However, once again, not universal. And when you look at this, if you look at the different animal sizes, the different species, we're probably are going to be seeing something similar where they actually do have, you know, it's a trade-off where we're moving toward the K-type selection. You're going to have a smaller number of young, but you're going to devote a lot of time to them. And what we're dealing with just time-wise, uh, yeah, obviously we, from the movie, it does appear as though they use the human time scale. So you have a basically a neonatal phase of probably one to two year or maybe about only one year you didn't have like the toddler phase leading up to adolescence that occurs in similar teen years to what we would see in humans but does anybody know when is a human brain fully developed isn't it 22 or something 22 to 25 years that's how long it takes for the human brain to actually reach maturity and once again this does create a situation where we measure maturity in terms of reproductive maturity. So when an individual goes through, you know, their version of puberty is capable of reproducing, but that generally occurs before the actual developmental maturity. So in the case of like a horse, um, many of them, they will reach reproductive uh, or uh, reproductive maturity within about, you know, 12 to 16 months, something along those lines. However, they are not considered to be mature adults until, oh, I'm going to probably say it's like five or six years. So it's a much longer period of time. And we see this with a lot of them. Once again, cats, dogs, they'll usually go through and be, um, and be from a reproductive standpoint, mature within six months, uh, six to eight months, something like that. But once again, they don't actually reach what we consider the adult stage until working towards the second year of life. So these are things where you have these different time points. And with a protracted childhood, once again, you're dealing with a situation where the young is not going to be capable of taking care of itself. You know, we have different degrees of that in the animal kingdom, just depending on what they have. And for some species, it's actually much easier than others. So, for instance, um, for a lot of herbivores, things like, you know, learning techniques to hunt, that's not relevant. It's not really needed. Uh, the amount of hands-on care that they need to learn the skills, as I said, for grazing, for anything like that, it's not needed. What it's needed more for is protection from predators, protection from things that are going to try to eat them. So that's what you end up having generally with uh, a lot of these species. And in fact, some of them is actually quite interesting. Is, has anybody ever looked at, uh, so zebra reproduction, when the foal is first born, what does the mother do? Does anybody have an idea? Isn't it look at the stripes to remember? She works to block the foal's view of every zebra except for her. Because that pattern, the zebra stripe pattern, that is the way how they recognize things. So if a zebra uh, you know, foal imprints on the wrong one, they're done. Because uh, even though they do live in herds, you don't, gen you don't tend to have any type of surrogacy. You know, the uh, female is responsible for taking care of her own uh, fawn or their own colt. Um, that's it. You do not have these issues like in a wolf pack where if they can, they're going to try and keep any pup alive. Yeah, so it's something where, as I said, it does get a little bit uh, complicated there. 
But yeah, and now if we actually are taking a look at this, so for gestation time, we can have a wide range that happens here. Uh, obviously, it is going to mainly depend on the size of the animal. So when we're dealing with afterbirth, though, from the movie, it really does seem as though we're dealing with a very narrow time frame that's shared across most species. We don't actually know this, um, but when we look at even some of the promotional work where we see Judy in school, we do see that it's a mixed, uh, you know, mixed class. However, one thing I did note is I don't think we saw any large mammals affiliated with, uh, with her school at that time. So whether or not there would be a difference there, because yes, just because of the size difference, a pregnancy for a rabbit is definitely going to be way shorter than an elephant. Uh, on the order of, you know, as I said, even if we increase the rabbit uh, time from, you know, 30 days to 50% more, 45 days, that's still nowhere near the elephant who's going to need like two years. <laughs> but once they're born, and this is one thing where we consider that it's this trade-off where you need to get them out before they get too big for the head to be able to pass through. That does mean that from a developmental standpoint, they're probably on par. So after that point, there is an argument that can be made for it's going to take them a similar amount of time in order to reach a uh, mental maturity. What's going to happen for sexual maturity or for actual adulthood? There can be a difference. We do know that once again, from the film, it looks as though we're dealing with human lifespans or something similar to it. Um, we don't see a whole lot of elderly mammals, but in my own mind, I do think that there would still be a difference uh, in how long it lasts. So yes, mammals like rabbits, rodents, these small ones that were originally definitely an R-type selective strategy, maybe their lifespans are only 50 to 60 years. We on do average. have some canonical information, like we have Mabel, the goat meter yes. mate. Who's nice? yes, the go yes, the goat, the old goat. <laughs> so yeah. yes, it's Andrew true. Hops is, one, is 100 or 101. Uh, I think 93 is Mabel. Because it was oh. in the newspaper. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, the newspaper that Judy wraps the carrots in. Ah, yeah. uh, yes, yes, right. Grandfather pa either passing up the 100 years and getting his telegram, or... Uh, yeah. One, I can't quite remember. Yeah, I know. It's, it's only, yeah, where the, he, like, well, he's got, like, a thousand grandkids, something like that. Well, I, think he, I think it was 800 or something. Oh, jeez. But, yeah. It, but it's remarkable, because a quarter of those come from just Bonnie. Yeah, which is just nuts. And once again, this whole idea of when well, we're dealing with reproductive strategies, Bunny Burrow is it is the worst possible thing you could have from a uh, survivability and a stability standpoint. We already mentioned this, but oh yeah, Flashing those resources. Internal screaming. Internal screaming. Internal screaming. <laughs> Internal screaming. <laughs> very, very much so. Oh, actually, uh, just dealing going back to that RK selective theory. Uh, so I already mentioned before something like pack animals that still display you know, uh, R-type litter sizes, but a K-type society. Actually, what's really interesting is when we move outside of mammals, so for things like um, fish or even bigger, some reptile species, once again, R-type selection strategies say that you have animals with um, short lifespans, they reach sexual maturity quickly, and they just try to have more and more offspring. If we consider something like the giant tortoise, and I put this in the notes, it is like the biggest exception to this. Why? Their lifespans commonly exceed 100 years. Uh, the oldest one on record is, I believe, they estimate it to be 250 years. And this was an individual that was basically in a zoo for most of the time. So we know that it was over 200. The estimate was uh, you know, how much it did, how its life was uh, outside of the zoo. They also take like 30 years to reach reproductive maturity. However, their reproductive strategy when they do decide to mate is to lay anywhere from six to two dozen eggs, usually bury them in a mound, and then leave. They have no parenting whatsoever. They drop the eggs and they get out. The only time in the case of some of them, like uh, sea turtles, they will only come back to that area when they're ready to breed again. And if anybody has seen it, it's kind of neat if you ever watch um, particularly either the loggerheads or any of the sea turtles, when they actually do come up out of the ground, for the sea turtles it's really neat because all those infants, the young, they just make a beeline for the ocean mm -hmm. um, to such an extent that, and this is one thing that uh, I'm glad they figured that out uh, in Cozumel, which is one area that I go scuba diving frequently. Beautiful place. Great. They do the same thing where they release the, you know, uh, in order to help the population, volunteers will come in and when it's time for them to hatch, they will actually help to open up the nest, make sure that the young can get there. But they found out 
uh, a few years ago when they started doing this to, uh, you know, because tourists would always be looking at it. The tortoises or the uh, turtles, they use the position of the sun and the reflection of the sun off the water to determine which way is the ocean. Flash bulbs, screw, yeah, flashes, really screw that up. Yeah, exactly. It's so, uh, anyone who is using lights or flashes, they completely confuse the, uh, you know, the young. So they would end up just going everywhere. And um, once again, just to give you, you know, the impression, nature does not give a damn about, you know, being kind or helping a species to survive. Because you just look at the environment where these nests are coming up. There are so many predators just waiting in the surf, in the air, on the land around them. As many so, birds actually tying their arrival to certain islands, so it's in time for these to hatch. Absolutely. And why? That's when the resources are there. And they're under the same pressures that everybody else is, namely that we actually have to, you know, I want to reproduce. I need energy so that I can go through, make my own offspring, and have them continue on. So your lunch, terribly sorry, we're out. But this does explain why with something like a tortoise, they've got K-type lifespans but our type of reductive strategies, as well as parenting levels. As I said before, like you want to talk about, uh, you know, rabbits being absentee parents. They've got nothing on a lot of the reptiles because yeah, many of those species or even some fish, they just leave their clutch there and that's it. Uh, one interesting exception to that is of course, uh, so cephalopods, uh, octopus mm. and kind of neat where the more we learn about uh, things like octopus, some of the species in particular, we mentioned before the mirror self recognition test. I would not be surprised if it wouldn't be the same as us just because their neurological development is so different from the mammalian side of things. But they have shown incredible uh, cognitive ability, problem solving abilities. Uh, whether or not they can actually recognize themselves, we don't know. I said they are very different from what we would normally consider normal neuroanatomy and development. So, but the question has been now yeah, how intelligent are they? Because they are also a species where. Some of them, when uh, the female lays the eggs, male fertilizes them, the female stays with them for the entire time that uh, they're growing. She stays until they hatch. She does not eat. Most of the time, she dies as a, process, as a part of this. But she is there for that entire time period, blowing, making sure that there's water flowing over the eggs constantly, oxygenated water flowing over them constantly. So once again, large number of eggs, but the mother literally sacrifices herself in order to ensure that they will at least be able to hatch and have a chance. I saw that on Animal Planet. And, said, Man, that was depressing for me. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. No, there's of so course, many of them. <laughs> I was going to say, of course, the other strategy, and the, probably the cleverest strategy, is the cuckoo. Oh, you, God, yeah. Let's uh, kick somebody else and let them take care of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did I know about yeah. that life? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, once again. Uh, so this was mentioned for those that don't know uh, the cuckoo. So yes, the thing that the cuckoo clock is named out, you know, that kind of idea, it is a real bird. What it does is it is nature's asshole. <laughs> Just complete and total jerks. Why? Because what it does is it takes the uh, it comes lays an egg in another bird's nest. And it's once again, the eggs. So well, nothing seems different. To oh, it's, uh, sometimes they don't even get rid of the egg. But what happens, though, is uh, the cuckoo eggs Generally, the species that they are essentially parasitizing, it takes their eggs longer to hatch than the cuckoo's eggs. So the cuckoo chick hatches first. Its first action, kick everybody else out of the nest, literally. So it actually goes through, either uh, knocks over the eggs or takes the actual chicks from the species that is actually trying to raise them. And yes, it just kicks them all out. Suddenly you have the parents where they will happily then feed the cuckoo chick not knowing that, yeah, that thing's actually a murderer. <laughs> the ironic <laughs> thing is, they're, uh, they're like much smaller uh, birds as well, aren't they? So uh, mm -hmm. you'll have an enormous chick, you know, and the parents yep. just, you know, don't bat an eyelid. Nope. And the cookie, and... it's designed to be incredibly appealing. It's like, it's like an, it's like a caricature of what a bird would consider cute or needy. So <laughs> there's no question about the mother bird feeding it. <laughs> Yeah. As I said, it's bigger, but also yeah, if you take a look at the size of the mouth in particular, it's larger than what you see in the other species. And of course, what that does is when it's you know, opening up his mouth, crying towards the, uh, the female bird, yes, it makes it that she's more than likely going to give it the resources. And once again, when we're dealing with the idea of animal sentience, 
Yeah, not a whole lot of bird species are going to pass that because if they can't even recognize a different species, the ability of them to recognize themselves is definitely not happening. It's like a real life ugly ducking. <laughs> oh yeah, oh no, and once again, I have said this before, I will say this again. Nature does not care. It is neutral, it is there, it's not evil, it's not good. It's just there. And I yes. Go ahead. Uh, what I always wondered is, in this utopia context where all the mammals have evolved, I wonder if the if birds have been actively hunted and, and like were driven to extinction. Because if you think if you're thinking about say uh, predatory birds, like they would mm -hmm. easily scoop up a rabbit or something. So in a in an evolved uh, society, either they would never have been there, which is a possibility, or they I have a feeling that they would have been actively hunted to extinction as a way to like protect the population oh yeah that's actually something where uh, another uh, author in the fandom two cent nuisance um where he and i actually had quite a few back and forth about this and yes that was my thought as well as when the utopian society was forming once again this gets back to that idea of you're dealing with communal mammals now these are ones where they live in groups and they're going to protect each other because yes Birds of prey uh, would definitely have been a major concern. And once again, things can get really dark, and I'll just allude to that in a bit. But yeah, if you're dealing with small mammals, the odds are they would have developed defenses against that uh, probably very early on. I could definitely see something like, you know, an actual predator species, for instance, or even a larger herbivore species. Basically, being a bounty hunter, they will go in and they'll kill the birds for you. Uh, in modern society, in particular, something at the technology level of Zootopia, I can only imagine that any birds of prey that are left in the wild are basically in nature reserves because they would probably have been wiped out very early on just because it is a risk. Same thing for a lot of uh, more tropical environments, but uh, a lot of insects, arachnids, anything that would feed on a small mammal, they would be prime for extermination Well, simply because it is a risk. There's also, and, there's also the interesting thought that, like, yes, they're prime for extermination, but here's the thing. You could also see them, I could easily see them being used, like like humans anymore. have in the past, that use them as weapons or such, like they would send oh. it to... I can see that happen, because we have, oh, in yeah. the past, also done the same as humans. I like, think yeah, well, think of... Oh yeah, well, no, that's, once again, we actually we did discuss this, uh, because yeah, we both actually thought, and the connotation of that is even darker. Because, oh, yes, yeah. falconry, uh, where you actually use birds or to hunt. If you know that your prey is sentient and intelligent, suddenly that activity becomes way more just complete and total evil. But it is definitely something that I could see. And once again, uh, probably that would have been the case. Uh, and once again, the issue there is training a falcon. Uh, that's actually a fairly advanced technique when we're dealing with a domestication event. So we don't actually see that occurring, um, you know, incredibly early. We're, we are in that Neolithic period, the uh, Paleolithic period. But we do start seeing that, as I said, in Egypt, where we're dealing with the Bronze Age and going further on. But my thought on that one is when we actually had that, whether it was a peace treaty, the organization, or just due to necessity, predator and prey species started living together, that probably would have stopped. And it's actually one that if we actually look at this, and sorry, this is a complete tangent away from, you know, the young ring that we were dealing with. But if we look at, uh, you know, how did these cultures evolve? And overall, well, I mentioned before, what is it that drives technology? War, medicine. If you're dealing with predator species, especially what they have, if they're dealing with a intelligent prey species, I would imagine that very quickly, the development of defensive weapons, uh, tactics, and capabilities would actually, you know, in a much shorter period of time than we would think, would probably push the predator species to not preying on them or just having them as completely opportunistic. They'll hunt them if, uh, you know, they'll hunt uh, prey species if uh, the situation is right. But by and large, you know, if the, that group has a bunch of spears or arrows or, you know, later on, firearms... The odds are I'm going to go and eat that lizard rather than try to fight that. So there would definitely be a, pre a pressure to work on there. And once again, this gets back to that idea of the, you know, moving between society, 
versus individual, you know, either tribalism, uh, it's isolated cultures, things like those. And it really just depends on how far back that goes. Yeah, and there's, there's another thought you could have about that as well is that uh, maybe because the prey, let's say, yeah, let's say prey animals evolved first, just for the sake of uh, for the sake of the hypothetical, then uh, what I always thought is, is an interesting idea is that because the prey animals evolved, the predators actually evolved with them, so they could combat it and still have the same meal. Because, like you said, the innovation uh, necessity is is the birth of innovation. Absolutely. So yeah, I think that could also be a thing where instead of instead of oh, I'm going to hunt lizards now instead of rabbits to say something, which is a reasonable uh, reasonable something something to say. Yeah. And let's say that for example, instead of doing that, they would say, oh. These are creating spheres, and now we grow more intelligence, so we can create spheres, so we can continue to do this. Yes, absolutely. And well, once again, I can honestly say, and we talked about this a bit with the um, the diet uh, discussion that we had, you know, previously. Where one kind of interesting thing to consider is the fact that this idea of predator and prey not preying on each other, basically bartering their natural skills in a way. So you yeah. could see predator species acting as the bodyguards acting as that and also another one that i mentioned before this is getting on with uh once again this idea of uh the evolution of manual you know, uh, either paws hooves something with manual dexterity is once again this is something that i've covered in lost causes and i've put it in a few other areas animals with paws have such a huge advantage in terms of manual dexterity that something like for instance say surgery I don't think there's any equine surgeons in Zootopia. <laughs> Simply yeah. because, yeah, they do not have, you know, the dexterity to do that. What that also means is that there are certain tasks that might very well be, uh, you know, very predator heavy. So if you're dealing with anything that would involve really fine manual dexterity, that's something that they can barter with. And when we're dealing with something like for the prey species, the odds are agriculture would have been developed first. But, as we said, as society moves, as the prey species become uh, more adept at being able to defend themselves, well, suddenly you can have a situation where the predators can basically barter their own skills. Once again, you're dealing with, uh, by and large, these are individuals that tend to have sharper senses. Uh, depending on the size, they, of course, range from small to large mammals. And additionally, it's something that they could then barter for uh, actual food. So this idea of and once again, this depends on you know, uh, the idea of how, you know, does P the PETA equivalent exist for, uh, in Zootopia for things like either the birds or reptiles? Because it might actually make sense for prey species to even be involved in cultivation of those. Why? Because the product that then can be sold and bartered for protection or, you know, whatever it is from the predator species. So you could actually have a very good dynamic there that works. I was, I was going to say, you're mentioning prey mammals raising food for the predators and that remind me in the recent chapter of take a stand which um basically some characters had a hangover so Barney decided to wake them up by bringing in a rooster a cock yeah. and i can help but think as uh, this is a story from a few years back we rescued a shrew or something from our cats which were useless <laughs> shrew went off wandered off under the electric fence into where we kept our chickens, and one of our hens went over and fuck, and it oh. pecked him on the back of his neck, killed him. So oh, I, was wow. saying, I was saying in my comments, chickens, particularly roosters, are vicious buggers. And oh. um, if he had rab it better be a bantam cock, or you might have loads of bunnies having death, death by rooster. Oh, yeah. death, death oh, yeah. chicken. That's a tragic oh, death, I, isn't it? No, I, I was just going to say, yeah, I have actually known uh, uh, I know in North America, I don't know how this is over in Europe or else uh, there's been a movement with, you know, uh, some individuals to have chicken coops in the backyard. You know, something's the idea of uh, whether you're dealing with just people wanting to have food security or it's just kind of neat and trendy, I'm not sure. But yes, yeah, I have actually, I've exactly actually read the nightmare stories and people don't realize if you put two roosters in close proximity to each other, they will kill each other. They are not very good. That's even why. Um, now, it's I don't agree with this practice, but of course, when you're dealing with chicken farming, it's quite common for them to actually burn off the beaks. Uh, and it is because the chickens, even the females, they will attack each other and even do things like uh, 
basically Peck in the uh, the Kaleka, which once again the combination of a, it's a general slit as well as for the anus, and they'll actually just pick and basically pull out the intestines of the other birds. Chickens are not uh, as you know sweet as people think. Uh, it's, now once again, yeah, uh, it's the term pecking order, dude. It's where it comes from. <laughs> Yeah. They've got a strict yeah. social hierarchy, which they Dag set up. Nabbit. I wanted to be here for more for this, but time to go to work. Oh, sorry. Thanks for showing up, though. Yeah. And Dag once again, uh, for anyone that does have questions, I keep monitoring both the uh, the Reddit thread as well as any of the others uh, just throughout the course of the weekend. So if you have questions, just ask. But yeah, let's actually just move in and we'll, we'll get into schooling now, because right now we basically well, we've I got the just... Oh. Actually, there's two big things you missed out, which are the oh, monotremes uh, and the um, marsupials. Ah, yes. So when you're dealing with marsupials, they're interesting, uh, really interesting, because they and humans are basically the only ones that give birth to an underdeveloped uh, offspring. And it's kind of neat, the different uh, reasonings for it. And yes, in the marsupials, the idea is if you take a look at some of them, yeah, they will give birth to uh, an animal that is, holy cow, you want to talk about underdeveloped. Uh, basically, they are at what would be considered to be probably late second trimester humans, uh, like that, that kind of level of development. So all of the tissues are in place. All of the bones are in place. The nervous system is in place. But there's nothing mature about it. And then they go through what amounts to uh, a period of, you know, they're in They're Actually, they've been uh, they've been born but they are not independent of the mother in any way, shape, or form. They're actually physically stuck with them. In the case of some of them, for example, with uh, some of the you know, red kangaroos and the like, uh, what is neat is when they actually go into the pouch and they uh, grasp on to uh, the nipple that's in there, or the teeth that's in there, there, it actually swells up and locks in their mouth so that they can't let go until they get old enough to be able to do it. So it's this idea of they are very different, and yeah, it's an entirely different strategy, but you still do see this thing where you can have, once again, the R-type versus K-type selections, and let's face it, also in Australia, yeah, there's a probably good reason for it, because everything's trying to kill you, repeatedly, <laughs> over and over again, in like the worst possible ways. <laughs> as, I, as I thought of it as I was born prematurely, and it's, hmm. if you, particularly if it's lining up with the start of the new year, Right. It's when do you record the birth of the kangaroo from? As if yes. You, if you, say, record it from when it comes out of its parent, then it might be going to school a whole year or something, or close to two years earlier than, say, a different mammal that was born in the usual way, simply because it was born underdeveloped. And if right. you're recording from that date then eerie starting school age five or six well still early compared to other mammals so there right. might be a system in place for compensating for that so yeah, actually one thing that one thing that i did not look at and i'll actually i will take a look at this probably over the rest of the weekend is what i'm just thinking right now is we've talked before about the fact that uh having this increased uh, cranial size means that the young is being delivered prematurely now I would need to take a look at the birth canal size in the uh, in the marsupials, because if they are already giving birth to a premature offspring, would they actually be coming out at effectively the same developmental level as the other mammals? Mm -hmm. So if something like that were to happen where they don't have, because once again, when they give birth, they're very tiny. So they're actually at a stage where the cranial development wouldn't be an issue. So as a result, are they almost more indicative of what the other mammals, what their young would look like initially? Uh, probably, I would guess that they're a little bit more advanced just because if you look at uh, you know, the marsupials when they are born, they are really at an early stage of development. But yeah, it's something where just based on the birth canal size and the timing, it might very well be a case where what marsupials do now is what mammals have to do <laughs> in that time period just because of the increased cranial size. So I'll need to take a look at that because, yeah, lo and behold, uh, did not bother to look up things like the pelvic size and birth canal diameter for uh, you know any marsupials. That didn't come up when I was looking, but that is something I am going to look at because it's a good point. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I'm actually we're getting into this idea of neurological development. Once again, I mentioned earlier, 
if we consider how long it takes for a brain to mature, uh, in particular, once again, we don't have a whole lot of examples of this, and um, I really hope we haven't actually done any research like that on non-human primates in order to do, do things like, let's take a look and see how things develop. But yeah, it's something where neurological development takes a long time. And in fact, if we look at uh, development overall, we do see parallels with other mammalian species uh, in some of these cases. Obviously, we can't test everything that involves higher reasoning or things like that, but you can look at things. And of course, so for the parents in the room, uh, anyone here that's ever worked at it, you know that things like object permanence, the thought that if an object is present on a desk, I put something in front of it to block its view. It takes, a, you know, a, you have to have a certain level of development before your brain is able to recognize that even though I can't see it, it's still there. That type of understanding. So the idea of object permanence, the ability to do something like recognize self, uh, understand that, you know, in a mirror, when you manipulate an image that you are seeing yourself. These are all things that don't come immediately at birth. There are things that develop over time as the brain develops. And as a result, what we end up with is it just depends. Is, and this is why, in some ways, it's a good idea that the film creators decided to make everything be uh, on a human time scale because it actually helps in the terms of schooling. You're dealing with these biological checkpoints that occur at fixed gazes, so or fixed, uh, fixed points, where you can have these neurological parallels occur. And in particular, when you're dealing with things like higher reasoning, that becomes critical because that is an enormous element of basically what makes us either, you know, uh, intelligent that enables us to be introspective, to be able to do things like consider past, present, future. Those are all things that, you know, a two-year-old kid can't really do. Um, and once again, it's one thing where I hope, I mean, this is a bad example. This is actually kind of a tragic example, but it is accurate. Um, I hope no one has to go through it. We all unfortunately tend to. Think about trying to describe death to a child. Oh, girls. At various developmental stages, they cannot process that. And there's many different stages of that. I mentioned before the idea of the permanence of death. Uh, trying to explain to a child before about the age of five or six, I believe, it might be a little different than that once again. I need to look, uh, go back and take a look at this. Where when you tell someone that, you know, you say that a, child, uh, you know, that a relative, a friend, whoever has died, they say, the odds are that child might still ask, when's he going to come back? The idea of this idea of permanence, the idea that, no, they're gone forever. And the whole idea of even trying to explain that is so far beyond their ability to comprehend. Uh, another one that actually happens, and this is interesting, the idea of permanence occurs before this, because one of the other key issues, and this is one that it is absolutely tragic when it happens, I've had it happen as well, but of course, when a relative, you know, if you're there when they pass, yeah, it's something where, you know, tragic, absolutely awful, worst thing you can imagine. But yeah, it's something where, uh, this was a few years ago, it was my grandmother, we've been expecting it for a while, but there was a younger cousin there. And they just, this is just an example. It's one, this has actually been observed uh, in humans as well. It's well studied. The idea of non functionality. So the fact that because this person has died, they can't just wake up. They can't, you know, come back. And that's what happened is you'll often have the child saying, why can't they wake up? Their brains have not actually developed to a stage where they can comprehend the fact that this person was alive. Now they are dead. And because of that, there's no further. You know, it's one where, and if you even try to explain that to a child, they're not going to get it. And this is something that came up uh, just a little while ago. Um, I believe it was when we were talking about, you know, Mr. Rogers was the case. And we brought it up once again. This is something for if you were a kid growing up in like uh, either really late 70s or 80s, Sesame Street, Death of Mr. Hooper. That was an absolutely amazing, you know, looking back on it now. Yeah, the child, it just destroyed me. I will be honest because, you know, once again, I didn't, I could understand the concept, uh, but they went and they looked and they actually had uh, the characters acting in a way that was appropriate for the kids. So, of course, one of the uh, one of the more tragic ones is throughout the whole thing. The character Big Bird, he is trying to you know, wrap his head around this idea of even though at the end of it, it looks like, you know, he's finally understood it. And then he comes up saying, you know, he drew a picture and he can't wait to give it to Mr. Hooper. And of course, they're going, he's not coming back. And he asks why. And 
the answer that they give? Because. How do you explain, you know, uh, the cessation of biological functions, something like that, that level of comprehension, it's not there. So when we look at neuroanatomy and neurodevelopment, that is something that is, you know, very complex. It's something that takes a lot of time in order to develop. And yeah, before you reach a certain stage, that level of either concrete reasoning, of abstract thinking, it's physically beyond your capabilities. And this is why we're dealing with education, even for something like Zootopia, where, yes, you actually have to have this structure. You can't have lessons occurring that the individual isn't ready for, whether it's on an emotional level, on a, a maturity level, on a uh, intelligence level. And if you try to explain these things too early, you are just going to make them more confused. And it's not a fact of them being, you know, intelligent or dumb or anything like that. It's quite literally their brains are not at a stage where they can even conceptualize those things. This isn't a universal. There is a range for when this occurs. But it's something that is very much a part of mammalian development. We haven't had a chance to look at something like this in terms of most other types of species. So whether it's birds, uh, you know, uh, birds, mammals, even reptiles. Uh, however, there is one example that definitely means that at least in terms of the, um, the non-human primates. Oh, yeah, we have enough evidence that they can process the idea of death and loss. And there's one in particular, um, I think it might have been Coco the gorilla again, and this is just kind of awful, where um, I don't remember how far back it was, but she was given a kitten. And she loved the thing. She just, you know, she was very careful with it, even though with a gorilla, you know, they're huge, they're incredibly strong. She was the most gentle thing possible. The kitten escaped and ended up getting killed. Uh, you know, I don't remember exactly what happened, but for some reason it managed to escape. It didn't survive. And when the trainers explain this to Coco. At first she didn't understand, but then suddenly it was like something clicked. And she just went, Coco sad, Coco cry. She actually left the room and in the audio tape, you can hear this gorilla weeping in the background. So something where even in non-human mammals, that level of understanding can occur. Now, once again, the idea of how much is it is there? Um, how much of that is consistent and reproducible, we still don't know. And this is why I mentioned earlier with the mirror self-recognition test, when we look at gorillas in the wild, they don't pass that. Coco was a special instance where she was raised by humans. Uh, her entire um, yeah, her entire life was around that. So her you know, basically mental development worked around that. She was there with a species that makes use of constant uh, verbal communication. Uh, that makes use of written linguistics, that where symbols become actual identity, where they become uh, objects and they have meaning. How much of that that she was able to understand? Once again, we don't really know. And the idea of once again testing, um, you know, human uh, human attributes onto animal species, it is very difficult because, and this is something that is very true. It's actually more commonly what it comes up in is something like sci-fi. Um, where in sci-fi, where you have the idea of first contact with aliens, and one of the key things to remember is that something like that you cannot assume psychology is universal. That is one thing you cannot assume. You don't know how a species, even you know, once again dealing with other um, species on Earth, even though we have a common ancestral lineage, how we've evolved over time from an evolutionary perspective, how our brains have developed they might be possible that they think of things completely differently than we do. And that's actually the problem where I mentioned before with things like octopi, you know, cephalopods. They have displayed utterly amazing problem-solving capabilities. But their neuroanatomy and what we can figure out of their psychology is completely alien. We don't have a common touchstone to work with. So as a result, there's a lot of stuff that can just be either mistakes can happen or, you know, anything like that where we can either give them attributes they don't actually possess, but in the other one, they might have attributes that we don't even recognize. So when we're dealing with something like Zootopia, that doesn't seem to be the case as much. And it also, it does help that we are just dealing with one, you know, uh, group of species, we're, uh, you know, one class, we're dealing with mammals, uh, by and large. You can also have the marsupials, those are actually fairly close related anyways, about 130 million years is the divergence point for those. But it's this idea of, yeah, when you first actually have, so you've gone through, you've given, you know, you've got your young, it's bored, you've managed to get it past the point of, uh, as I said, like that stage where it's actually trying to kill itself at every turn.
But now we get into the idea of how do we then integrate and how do we get that child uh, to be a part of society where they learn what they need to do, but also that, um, you know, they have the general information, things that everybody needs to know, but also the species specific stuff. And this more factors into things like diet, nutrition, medicine, anything like that, where, yes, the different species, things are going to be differently. I mean, you don't have something like um, fox species. They don't have to worry about, you know, grinding down their incisors constantly. Rodents do. In the case of something like uh, for dealing with uh, the ruminant animals, in that case, you know, most mammals don't need to keep track of the health of four different stomachs and the contents of each. In horses, they actually have to do that. Uh, so there are things where there's specialized information that is species specific, but then also the common stuff. And this is why what I said, uh, and we talked earlier before we officially started this. But yeah, I break down schooling in the documents just as early childhood, primary schooling, high school, and then higher education. My thought is initially... You do. You limit this to based on closely related species, uh, at least for the overall goal. And this is something where uh, we actually did do something similar to this with me uh, when I was growing up, but where I was in a French immersion program, first one in the city that I was in. And how they handled this was, is yes, <clears throat> for most of my time there, I was with the same group of people. We were all there. We were all in the French immersion program. But what they did do is some classes, we would actually go out and then intermingle with uh, the other programs that were part of this. Something similar can be there for the actual teaching portion, in particular, what you're dealing with things like reading, writing, arithmetic, the things that are shared, those can occur. And once again, from just a monitoring standpoint, if the teacher can focus on either one group of mammals and work within them, in particular, when we're dealing with, say, uh, one thing we don't know once again in Zootopia is things like how exactly do mammals you know, process color? Are they like what we are, where you actually have most mammals are only a dichromat? Or is it something that they all have human vision? So they're tetrachromats or I mean, uh, trichromats or, you know, once again, there is actually there are some tetrachromats that are actually uh, out in the wild with peop uh, you know, people that have this ability. Um, once again, completely random, random factoid. Um, mammals lost the ability to see some colors uh, when we actually were originally we branched off from uh, the, you know, probably about once again, that 130, 100 or 130, 95 million years ago, where we see that most uh, reptiles appear to have four pigment receptors. However, with mammals, especially when they first came out, they were universally small, mostly nocturnal. Well, color doesn't show up very well at night. So as a result, uh, just over time due to mutations, they lost. Uh, normally, it is the one. It normally, it, the color receptor for red green. Uh, so that that differentiation, where that was the one that was lost, and by and large, did not have any effect after the uh, the Cretaceous and the uh, uh, the KPG um, extinction event. You know, the asteroid that hit down by Cosmo Mexico in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, after that, then the range expanded, and in the case of some species, they just basically redeveloped one of the missing uh, receptor molecules. And in the case of some people, they do end up with the fourth as well. But it's kind of neat that originally we were able to see more colors. And we actually lost that at some point simply because the environment that we lived in, it wasn't an advantage. And that is something, once again, just to clarify, if uh, anyone hasn't looked at the stuff in the back, it's a common misconception that evolution finds the best solution. It doesn't. That's not how it works. All evolution cares about from a natural selection standpoint is that one individual through the development of random traits has an advantage. So it's looking for better, not best. And as a result, for something like color vision, if we look at those early mammals, color vision was not an advantage for them. Uh, basically, they went out at night. All they need to be able to see is basically grayscale. Nothing else really matters. However, as they then became day, um, as, they, as they became active during the daytime after the extremely large reptilian predators, you know, the, the big one, suddenly color vision became important. Can anybody see, guess why? What did it let them do? Mm -hmm. it before the food yes. and stuff, stripe and stuff like that. Bingo. Fruit ripeness, food ripeness, the ability to be able to see that something is ripe and ready to be consumed. 
that's what that really allowed. It allowed for differentiation of that. And as a result, that's a big selective pressure. But it only became important, uh, as I said, when they stopped being nocturnal. So when we're dealing with, once again, education, start off small groups, make it so that the, uh, the teachers can actually handle all of the various, you know, uh, bits that are being in there. And they can actually focus on one small group, as opposed to, as I mentioned before, something like if you've got a class, like let's say you are a mid-sized mammal, you know, you are a, yeah, you know, a primary school teacher. And if you've got a class that contains both, say, you know, a bison and either, you know, a ferret, some rats, something like that, just your ability to keep track of what they're doing or from a simple design standpoint, making sure that everyone in that classroom can both uh, be engaged in all the content as well as be seen by the, you know, by the teacher, by the monitor, it becomes a lot more difficult. And in particular, once again, young children, attention spans, not the best times. And once again, that is once again, uh, part of that is, yeah, uh, humans just in general, we don't do well when we're bored. It's something that depends on who you are. Some people are more, you know, they're able to handle this better. But I know for myself, anyone else, oh, yeah, if I am in somewhere that I just do not want to be there, holy cow, my mind is everywhere but here. <laughs> so after we had that early childhood screening, what was again? You go through primary school, you would probably have something like maybe half the day you have groups, you know, your homeroom, as it would be. And your homeroom is going to be a group of species that are going to be similar than you. This is once again where you get that idea of the common elements of this. So you would actually, this is where you know, your civics class would be. This is where uh, even history, uh, anything like that would occur. But then also when you go out and you might then be intermingled with other species. And what they probably would do is start off once again, similar groups. So based on size as opposed to species. And then uh, once again, the shared material, you just have it where more and more you integrate them early. And part of this, and this is actually something that I was really thinking of for education strategies. I actually think that, uh, so this is something where personally and throughout you know, my schooling, uh, at least once I got to university, it was better. I always hated group work. So because inevitably, um, yeah, I was the type where I would kind of do all of it and not mm -hmm. get any help. So there is that. But for a society like Zootopia, exercises like that that emphasize the advantages and disadvantages of different species. And once again, learning how to use those skills in a communal setting, I can see that as being a big part of it. And the easiest way to do that would be to integrate it into some type of, you know, a class, basically the equivalent of physical education, you know, gym, gym class, something like that, where it's based off of problem solving and having to use the either natural or learned abilities of the different species in order to do it. And by doing that, once again, you at an early, early stage, you're ingraining that idea of a cohesive society. How accurate that would be, not entirely sure, because once again, we do know from the film, uh, there are some prejudice involved. Now, fortunately, something like, you know, uh, Judy's play at school, we do see that there's an there's a mix of predator and prey there. So by and large, it's probably a similar idea where, yes, in that thing, you got a bunch of different friends, different species, all that stuff. They still work together. And part of the learning is the idea of and how they would uh, you know, package this up. It could just be something along the lines of, you know, we're better together than separate, something like that. I was going to say that that thing was when Judy was nine. So it's showing that yeah. by that time, they've got integration within some broad size classes. So you might have the rodents, you might have small animals up to about the tiger. Then you might have, the large one, so three or four classes by that stage. Hmm. And then maybe oh, yeah. by high school, it's all, well, by a few exceptions, it's all together. And there's another thing that's also quite interesting about that, is that it makes me think how old all the mammals are there, because if they are similar age, then that would imply mm -hmm. that the growth is completely different, because I can guarantee you that a nine-year-old nine tiger is not that tiny. Oh, yeah. Actually, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a it wasn't a, well. It was a giant in the yeah. We, play, you know what I mean. A jaguar, a jaguar, and in the cutscene it was a bobcat. So yeah. <laughs> Either way, yeah, well, you, you know, you know what I'm implying. Yeah. <laughs> no, of course. And well, once again, that is one where. But we see in the film, it does seem to indicate that yes, uh, from a actual growth standpoint, things seem to go evenly. But I do, as I said before, I can see for there to be a difference there, so that some of the smaller mammals they might very well reach uh, either 
sexual or physical maturity a few years earlier than others. So yes, the odds are yeah. that, yeah, let's say when we're talking about puberty for something like an elephant, maybe that starts closer to like 15 years old, as opposed to say for a rabbit, where it might start at eight, something like that, where it's a, it's a difference, but over the long term, you are going to have a different average life expectancy. But once again, due to the convergent nature of what's happened there, there would definitely be a pressure to actually try and match these things up. And once again, as I mentioned before, the survivability and the natural lifespans of most animals in the wild are really reduced simply because of the fact that, yeah, there's a lot of things that are happening there. Once again, nature does not care. And no matter where you are, unless you are an apex species, something considers you as lunch. <laughs> Yeah. So that does make things a little bit more difficult. Uh, and this is also why, of course, once again, trying to explain this to people is when you take a look at human life expectancies. Um, when we take a look at through our history, of course, the average human life expectancy has increased immensely. But our actual lifespans really haven't changed all that much in our time of civilization. What's happened is our medicine, our ability to actually, you know, uh, live has improved to such a stage that we're able to just last until our bodies actually wear out. Whereas before, oh yeah, you'd be dealing with something like, you know, 70% childhood mortality, or even higher in some cases. Uh, depending on the conditions that are occurring out there, you could actually have where, and it has happened, I mean, just take a look at something like the Black Death, where half of Europe's population, gone. <laughs> As a result, that definitely would have had a damper on the, you know, uh, the average uh, life expectancy at that stage. And also, I see that in the comments. I see you know, Julius making a very good state, uh, making it more well, something that's actually quite interesting. Is that he says that given his Judy's parents, uh, he well, he won, he's going to guess that prey and predator haven't been in the, into getting classes for long because of their prejudice. So yeah. I, I am I like he, he makes a good point there, or she for that matter. But I'm curious actually how that will work as well. Yeah, it's one where. Um... Well, we know from the that's it, from the history museum, we have an idea that there would have been uh, at least the initial contact and the you know the treaty between whatever you want to call it, uh, predators and prey. It did happen a long time ago, but once again, that doesn't have to be universal. And in fact, I can actually see something like in some cultures in particular. So, in particular, if we go and look at um, Arctic cultures, so we're up in the Arctic. That area would be really heavy predator based simply because there's not a lot of plant material year round that people can consume or that mammals can consume. The animals up there almost universally, they eat meat. They will eat humans in some cases where uh, if they have, they have to have the chance. Yeah. So in those cases, that type of interaction between predator and prey probably happened much later. And well, this is actually something where I believe in one of the, I don't know if the previous read for the science discussions, but somebody made the comment of, uh, so think, you know, Viking mythology, that idea. And this first thing that popped into my mind is I, you know, played 40K or Warhammer 40K for quite a while growing up. Um, the fact that you could literally have Fenrisian raiders, so a bunch of wolves actually patrolling down, uh, patrolling down the shorelines and just completely uh, pillaging villages, that's something that could very well have happened. And once again, it's the idea of, Farming doesn't work very well in a lot of these northern climates. Um, it's actually only in modern times that we have really managed to develop and uh, actually make in, uh, lines of plants, varieties of plants, where, you know, 100 years ago, you couldn't plant something like corn in the Arctic Circle. Even now, you don't want to do it. It's, it's really hard, and you know, you're almost better to put it in a greenhouse, which is ridiculous. But the growing season is just too short. And if that's the case, if there isn't enough uh, plant material that's available, your herbivore population is going to be really low. If your herbivore population is really low, then the carnivores really only have a uh, limited diet to work with. But as long as they can keep doing that, and of course in northern climates, particularly if we look at uh, species like polar bears, uh, seals, actually a lot of cetaceans that are up in that area, yeah, there's more than enough meat to survive. But what we end up with is you have predators eating predators as well as prey species. Yeah. So it is something where, yeah, from a developmental standpoint, there was probably different treaties at different stages that would occur. And once again, it really does depend on the degree of integration that you have. Because once again, what is one of the key things from a society standpoint that causes tensions to occur? And in that case, of course, what it is, is a lot of times it is just resources, whether you're dealing with food, water, uh, shelter, 
depending on your level of culture, for some strange reason, people have issues with like bright shiny stones or yellow metal, even though it's not exactly the most useful thing. But yeah, it's this idea of something of value that they want and that they are either lacking or simply they want is the idea. Mm-hmm. So as things were, as things would, you know, as you get older, as you grow in high school, that yeah, at that stage, I would say, aside from the most extreme disparities of either size or developmental standpoint, integrated at that stage. Um, I can definitely see that happening. And of course, at university, in higher education level, you're dealing with, well, once again, I always want to do a quotation mark, just the fact because of the work that uh, I do being at a professor at a university, technically my students are adults. Boy, have I seen evidence otherwise. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where the idea of, yes, uh, yeah. Uh, the undergraduates in particular, first time away from home. Oh, yeah, you have to be careful on the roads for that first couple of weekends because, uh, once again, drinking age up here in Canada is 19. So, yeah, it doesn't take much in order for that to happen. But regardless, at a university level, fully integrated. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the major indicators that I would say would happen for schooling at that stage is that it would be like your job opportunities, your career opportunities, your education opportunities are probably going to involve some aspect of your species, your body type, and of course, the level of uh, manipulation that, is, that you're capable with in the environment. So for, once again, with the predator species or rodent species, where they're the ones that have paws, they're the ones that are going to be the most, um, have the most manual dexterity, they have more doors open to them than for some of the others. However, when you're dealing with uh, outside of academic training, if you're dealing with like skilled trades, I can definitely see large mammals uh, having a huge advantage on the construction. So because who needs a giant, uh, you know, a giant piece of machinery in order to move these concrete slabs? We've got Joe over there who can just pick it up. Mm-hmm. So it's the idea of the animals can work within what they have. And it really does um, to tell you the truth. When you're dealing with like the demarcation point between what will be considered as the white collar versus blue collar jobs. That's more going to be based upon like the ability to perform the task um, as opposed to the education. Because what we've seen, intelligence level wise, species are relatively the same. We don't really have examples of uh, there being a big disparity in just innate intelligence. Everyone seems to be at about the same level. Uh, And really just comes down to what type of education they have, whether it's formal training or they just pick things up along the way. It's those skills that become critical for being able to determine what's there. And once again, there might also be cultural uh, you know, things. And uh, I'm going to mention it again, but two cent nuisance. Uh, one of the things that we had discussed as a possible story before we both just got ridiculously uh, ridiculous busy and just complete side tangent for anyone that does read lost causes of broken dreams. I am sorry. I have been so swamped. I know it's been three months. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I still need but, to catch uh, yeah. Oh God. Yeah. It's one more. But anyways, so that was one thing we discussed was the idea of occupation and social status. And what was really interesting was we got to this, you know, thinking that, you know what? Different groups would probably value different processions completely differently. Uh, The thought that we come up with was an interesting scenario of um, a prey species. I think we're working with a rabbit where just due to circumstances, lost his job, is looking for work. The only thing that he can find is at a butcher shop where he's actually involved in the preparing and selling of meat for other predators. So what you're dealing with there is of course, that would probably be something that, you know, their family, uh, you know, his family, his friends that are, you know, similar species that could actually be something along the lines of, you know, he's a traitor. He can be even worse than than, than the predator species. Uh, But that same position, that of a butcher in a, a predator heavy region, that would probably be a really respected role. It's one that's essential for the community and would, that individual would probably be viewed incredibly positively. So the whole you know, uh, dichotomy of that, just how one job is viewed completely differently depending on something as, you know, do you eat meat or are you completely herbivore? Yeah. And so something with that would be really just interesting to consider. As I said, it's unfortunate we both got ridiculously busy, but I'm still working on, I've still got that, you know, in the back of my mind, but it was also something where, as I said, uh, he was also the same one that we were talking about with using falconry and warfare, things like that, where, yeah, it suddenly becomes much darker when you realize, oh, the things that they're killing are sentient. Yeah, yeah. we're monsters. <laughs> 
Well, like, again, you can argue that, yes, that is quote-unquote monsters. Then again, if you th- if you think about it, every wo- every human human war is killing yeah. sentient beings. So, like in this, like yes, it may sound monstrous, but if you think about it, it really isn't when you compare it to mm. sentient beings just fighting over something. Oh, it's true. But once again, it also it does entirely depend on the why. Why are you doing that? Because let's face it, when we're dealing with something like war, I think everybody here can agree that although I hate it, sometimes you are in fact fighting for the right cause. However, then we have something like, oh, I don't know, World War II and about uh, Poland, where, yeah, that's not acceptable for warfare. You know, so that idea of self-defense is one thing, targeting and exterminating a species is completely different. So in this case, for something like uh, our idea was, of course, uh, we were basically looking at this as more of a uh, dark age, medieval type time period, uh, is the idea that they weren't doing this for uh, any type of economic gain. Because at this stage, you may be dealing with, you know, if you're dealing with small mammals, uh, that population, herbivores, they probably are living in the equivalent of you know, what would be villages for us. Whether or not they're mixed species or anything like that, some will, some won't be. But in that case, is there really an economic or in many cases even a moral reason why it would be okay to essentially hunt them for sport? Or, you know, Because it's not an actual war action. It's more of a pastime of the aristocracy. Yeah. So at that stage, once again, very different connotation. And yes, if we look at fighting in general, if you're fighting over, you know, to defend your land because, you know, situation's bad. Uh, even if we, heck, you can even bring it to the stage of the idea of um, I'm fighting them because they fought, you know, my uncle 20 years ago and we have a grudge. Even then, there's some level of justification there as opposed to the idea of we hunt them for sport. Yeah. So that is, you know, just in my opinion, something very different. But... Yep. There's an also the completely completely is going back to growth and development, which is yeah. I mean, more on topic, but in that sense, off topic. Um, yeah. So, we know it's, uh, <laughs> 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 Do we know who that is? Tu okay. votre micro votre microphone est actif. Moi je comprends rien à ce qu'ils sont en train de dire. Parce que les types sont pas anglais en plus. Alors du coup si tu veux j'ai plein de films. Mais je, 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 Star Wars même. Merci. Le... 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 original. En version originale en plus. Ah. Alors Baraka ça vous intéresse un truc dépressif tiens. S'il vous plaît, déactivez votre microphone. Ça me fait penser. Ils passent tous en version longue au cinéma. Ils sont en train de parler. Est-ce qu'on peut voir qui est en train de parler Je crois que c'est le prochain. 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 Le 1, déjà, il dure 3 ou 48. Le 2, je ne sais plus combien. Et le 3, il dure 4 heures dans le point. Sorry, Can somebody write down the person's name in the chat because I can't hear the name over the background. Um, there you go. Two. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, well, now, of course, they're done. All right. <laughs> I've okay. muted him. Have you all muted him or? No, you got Sophie muted. Yeah. Okay. Good. Anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what I was what I was saying was um, oh. oh, and he left. That's beautiful. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well. It sounds anyway. like he was actually having a conversation. So yeah. Yeah. Fair <laughs> enough. But what I was wondering was because I because we we dealt with uh, a lot of well a lot of I'm just gonna say canids because that's the only thing I can think of on the top of my heart. But I know this, it's a case for different types of mammals. Right. But we all know, well we have, we know that they have dew claws which on their mm-hmm. own as of now aren't very useful. But I always want. I've always wondered, like, with because people often say, like, okay, instead of having their, uh, the, instead of having an opposable thumb, they have a dew claw. So, in, in the evolved version, they, their dew claw would have become their opposable thumb. Right. But I'm wondering, what if the dew claw still stayed? Like, what if, like, there was like a new, like a new digit that would just evolve? If that makes sense. Um, well, once again, that is possible. 
And we actually do see something like that. It's actually, uh, once again, for animals with what's called polydactyla, where they have additional digits, yeah. uh, something like cats have that very frequently. So something like that can happen. Uh, the issue that, and the reason why I think most uh, times when you're dealing with these type of characters, they use the Dewclaw, is generally from an evolutionary standpoint, it's easier to have uh, changes occur to an existing structure as opposed yeah. to having one develop from new. In particular, uh, that idea, of course, one of the big things with our ability is uh, the fact that, yeah, our thumb, it's opposable. It's one that you can press it against the other fingers in order to make a grip. And that's the key thing. So even if you were to have something like a polydactyl cat where they have six toes, those are still in the same orientation on the paw as the fingers would be. So their ability to actually grasp with that is pretty minimal. Yeah. So you do, need, you do need to have that opposable nature in order to have any hope of being able to grasp onto things. Yeah, no, because like, uh, like in a lot of cases you see the Jew Club being used, they're well, very reasonable, don't get me wrong. I've always wondered, like, what if, you know? Again, yes, yeah. for the reasons you've mentioned, it would be very unlikely, but still. Then again, having every male species be sentient. I'm yeah, also okay. pretty unlikely. <laughs> yeah. I'm, fully, I'm fully willing to do that. I mean, once again... Um, when I went back and worked on the evolutionary timeline, eventually I did fully acknowledge that I went way too deep down the rabbit hole, but I was actually considering I have a bioinformatics server in my lab uh, that's what is it, 96 CPU cores and just over a terabyte of RAM. Yeah, that thing, um, I was actually considering renting some time on it in order to run population models. I said, nope, this has gone too far. I'm stepping back. <laughs> yeah, because if you, get, if you get to that stage, then you are committed to a point where it's like, you can't go back from that. Nope, nope. That's, that, was, that, was, that would have been crossing the Rubicon. Done. So no, as it was, that's why. The, uh, the estimates that I made, they were based off of uh, just known models and the most likely scenario. But one thing to keep in mind, and once again, this is getting back to the idea of evolution as a whole. Um, it's the idea that any single evolutionary pathway is ridiculously unlikely. Oh, yeah. Why? Because it's all based on random events. None of this, at least before humans were developing and did even genetic modification in terms of selective breeding or in terms of the new stuff with transgenics, um, everything before that, it's random. And it just is the luck of the draw where you have a mutation occurs, a gene fusion occurs, a gene duplication occurs. Hell, whole chromosomal duplication occurs. When you have that, if that gives the individual an advantage, that becomes the dominant allele. Depending on uh, when we deal with the idea of natural selection, one key concept is something called selective pressure. So this is the idea of how does, um, when you have a stressor on a, a population, on individuals, how much of a stressor is it? Because the stronger the natural selective pressure, the more rapidly any trait that gives an advantage to the individual will become part of the actual just genetic makeup, the dominant allele in society. We actually have a couple of instances of this. And one of the biggest ones, uh, so if anybody has ever looked, uh, there's been a group down in the States, the Lensky Lab, uh, which is working on something called the long-term E. coli experiment. What they did was they took a culture of E. coli, just a bacteria, uh, that was incapable of using a molecule known as citrate as a carbon source. It lost the ability to do it due to a series of deletion events. So they started growing the bacteria in uh, media where the only there was only a tiny, tiny amount of available carbon for them to use uh, in order to grow. The rest of it was in the form of citrate. So what happened was they then went through and every two weeks, you split the culture, you keep one, uh, you just keep it going. They kept that culture going for now it's going on to when I think maybe. God, it might be getting close to like 25 years. And what happened was a series of mutations. But what was really neat is, of course, because of how they did this with the culture, they were able to take and extract the DNA and sequence it at various time points in order to see exactly what changes happened. And what happened was due to a series of a gene duplication, a fusion event, and a promoter capture. So you have the gene itself. The promoter is what tells uh, where and when that gene gets expressed, where they were suddenly able to use citrate again. Within only a handful of generations, that population was the dominant allele. Those, uh, those other uh, groups that didn't have the mutation, they were just outcompeted damn near instantly. Uh, in human evolution, of course, one of the major mutations that occurred in humans, uh, once again, wasn't universal, but actually did happen in several different geographic regions. So there's multiple, uh, multiple mutation events that happened. Um, the ability to 
uh, digest lactose into adulthood. So the enzyme lactase normally that gets shut down uh, after our juvenile period when we're when we're no longer nursing. Uh, yeah. But in particular, what happened was there was a group out of Africa, one in the Mediterranean, as well as up into uh, Europe that developed a mutation that enabled them to then continue to eat dairy, continue to eat anything that contains lactose well into adulthood. And one of the key things that it gives a huge advantage of is, of course, for those of us who are uh, currently living in a northern climate, during winter, there's not a whole lot of sun. Uh, or it's just really cold and you don't want to go outside. So something like vitamin D production was it crashed in a lot of these European populations. We take a look at them at the time when this was developed. And so what happened is that's a huge evolutionary advantage. Suddenly you can supplement uh, a known or a, you know, a needed uh, nutrient in order to increase the survivability of you and everyone else. That was also the reason why, of course, human skin color, as you went further up north, we lost a lot of the melanin production because if you're already in a situation where you don't get enough sun, having a skin color that is not going to absorb the UV light and enable vitamin D production, not an advantage. But that just shows you that these changes, they're random, but if it gives an advantage, it doesn't take a lot of time for it to become dominant. And that's something that could happen anywhere. So when you're dealing with the idea of, is particular, um, you know, the evolution of the paws or hooves, something like the ability to grasp, the ability to manipulate, and what that leads to is, of course, the ability to make tools. Huge selective advantage, both in turn, and it actually doesn't matter which uh, mammalian species you're looking at, because even with the prey species, of course, the ability to grasp and manipulate, particularly the small prey, the ability to grasp and manipulate things, suddenly, let's face it, most of them don't have claws. They don't particularly have sharp teeth, but they can make a spear now uh, if they want to and the development, as we've seen in terms of human evolution, of course, very rapidly from a developmental standpoint, our ancestors moved from just making absolutely primitive, just sharpened pieces of wood to having either stone tipped eventually to metal tipped, but also they developed better ways of using the technology. And some of them are ridiculously simple. Uh, for instance, has anyone ever seen, uh, I don't know what the actual term for it, but basically it is a uh, device that allows you to throw a spear. It increases the length of your arm. As a result of that, you're able to impart more force onto a spear, throw it farther and harder. And quite literally, all yeah, it is is a yeah. chunk of wood. Yep. I've, seen, I've seen you talking about, but I can't remember the name. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it might be a spear thrower. But yeah, that's the idea of just that simple modification by increasing the arm of the length of the lever that's being used, which is basically what the arm is at that stage. They were suddenly able to throw a spear farther. And more importantly, it then because of that increased speed had way more impact. And so suddenly now you would you have situations where and let's face it, you know, early humans, really, when we look at uh, our species as a whole, our survivability in terms of natural defenses and whatnot, we are really lacking. <laughs> I mean, we are slower. Uh, by and large, our natural weapons are gone. <laughs> they don't have them anymore. Uh, we're not really good at doing anything but biting. But what we do have is, yes, the ability to manipulate the environment. Uh, we can actually make a lot of changes in order to affect the environment that's all around us. And in particular, yes, we can develop tools or what of course happened in later on is we also figured out how to do things like uh, use the environment to our advantage. So uh, once again, looking back and there's been some uh, dig sites that have been absolutely fascinating looking at how humans would do things like hunt woolly mammoth. You know, massive, massive species where a human on their own or even with something like a spear, you are at a disadvantage here. However, if you can scare them and get them to run off a cliff. Mm -hmm. Gravity does the work for you way better. <laughs> oh yeah. So something like being something like being able to use either fire, noise, anything to move animals in a direction, to be able to control things, to control the environment, huge advantage. All right. Exactly. So I, I guess say, there's an interesting thing I read about about in Australia: hawks were grabbing bits of thing, bits of wood that were on fire, throwing them into grass, and using it to harry out the prey. Yep. Something like that. Oh, no, once again, yeah, using fire, that has been a common, common tool. Uh, once again, however, kind of risk reward thing, because anyone who has been in the US, oh, say California in the recent past, mm. um, yeah, that can actually go fire. badly. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's one more, uh, well, once again, any tool is dangerous to both the wielder and the, and the target oh, yeah. under the right conditions. 
Well, even, so, even, like, it used to, yeah, like, ah, oh, sorry, my head's not working. No, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. But, uh, so, I guess, uh, yeah, just the last area that we want to talk to is, once again, the study of hybrids. And, ah, uh, this is interesting. <laughs> yeah, so this is actually one where it's, it is interesting in a way because there's a lot more involved in this. And one thing that's kind of interesting is both from uh, like there's advantages and disadvantages. And what we often see with hybrids, and this is particularly present, it's something like when we see the uh, the Liger or the Tygon, depending on, oh, and just if anybody wants to know, when you come up with the names for these hybrid species, the general convention is to use uh, the paternal species, the maternal. Male, second part of the female. There, there's no actual rules for it because once again, um, in scientific notation, we don't call them ligers or tigons what we would write down is the actual species name for each of them with a cross in between them because that's how we would write it but for the uh, generic term that's used you use the paternal uh species common species name and then the maternal so in the case of once again the idea of nick and judy you're dealing with funnies as opposed to boxes (laughs) there's one thing that is quite interesting about the ligon tiger example is that there is actually a difference in which which like the theme like depending on who is the parent that actually yep. differs as well which i which i love that as well like effectively it's the quote unquote same hybrid but yep. uh the parents are different and it's like why would you name that differently i mean yes of course because of that once again that's it and from a scientific standpoint and this is actually something that's very important uh when dealing with you know reproduction as whole sexual reproduction at least one thing to remember is there's more than one genome in your cells in yeah. the case of animals, there's two different materials. You've got your uh, DNA from the nucleus. You also have the, uh, the genome of your mitochondria. Yeah. And why we have to keep track... Uh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, you just phased out there. Out of oh, the sorry. All right, let's just make sure that's at the back. Uh, what I was saying there is the reason why it's important to keep track of which donor was from which side, from which species, is because... Uh, although the nuclear genome is a combination of both the male and female gametes coming together, the chromosomes coming together, the mitochondrial... Yeah, just for the mother. Only the mother. There yeah. are very, very exceedingly rare instances that you actually have paternal uh, inheritance. I don't think any animals do that. That happens in some plant species, in particular like uh, conifers and gymnosperms, where that's more likely to occur. But no, in mammalian species, there is a genetic component that you only get from one. It's the same reason why whenever you have uh, in the nuclear genome, if uh, we're dealing with humans, if you have a Y chromosome, there's only one place you got that from, your dad. Yeah. That's it. So that is the only option there. So by keeping track of which species gave which, um, you know, contributed which gamete or, uh, you know, whether it was a sperm or an egg, it's important for that type of stuff because it does affect uh, how the lineage continues on. So what we do see though is there's an effect where if you're crossing two species together that are, or even actually within a species, if they're individuals that are genetically you know, divergent, there's ones that they've been spreading apart due to any number of factors. And when you're dealing with uh, populations, speciation, where you have them actually moving away from a common species, you can have this happen because of geographic isolation. Basically, the individuals of these populations, they don't have the opportunity to interbreed. So they become isolated that way. You can have what's called reproductive isolation. This is more commonly seen in insects where quite literally the parts don't fit together anymore. Uh, You actually see this just because of the design of both the male and female uh, genitalia. It's only going to fit with your own species. Uh, You can then have biochemical or even sociological barriers. But I need to say what happens is these populations have been divergent for a while, but that means that there's differences in their genomes, tiny ones. So as opposed to what we see where, you know, if you try to make a broad hybrid where you end up with two instruction manuals that tell you to do completely different things, you can end up with the instruction manual that just tweaks things a little bit. So there's a bit of genetic incompatibility, things aren't quite working out, and what that causes in both plants and animals is an effect called hybrid vigor. What we find is uh, these hybrid species tend to be bigger than either of the parents. Uh, there are exceptions to this, for instance, uh, something like what I mentioned before, the koi wolf. <laughs> sorry, I was yeah. just reading the comment. Uh, sorry, yeah, so something like the koi wolf, where uh, the offspring there, they're smaller than the wolves, but way bigger than the coyotes. So there are actually limits, depending on what you're dealing with. And once again, it's something where I remember someone suggesting that technically 
a, you know, a Chihuahua and a Great Dean are genetically are genetically compatible. I would not like to test that. <laughs> well, they are, but not physical, like not bodily. But I think that's what's like biggest issue. I, I'm pretty sure that genetically they are similar enough that it would work. Yes. Yeah. But what we happen is, and actually there have been other ones uh, where, for instance, some species of dogs, the, uh, the embryos are so large that the mother has to go cesarean section. I believe British bulldogs are uh, one species or one a breed that does that. But yeah, there are actual limitations on what we can do with that. Now, all right, I'm just getting a note that, yeah, we'll have to just wrap it up, but I'll just mention briefly. So the hybrid vigor effect, what we end up with is bigger, uh, bigger uh, either animals, crops that produce more, but what we also notice is those genetic incompatibilities, when you put it into an animal, there tends to be some level of intellectual or developmental delay from an intellectual standpoint. Oftentimes, these individuals, they can suffer from immune issues. They can suffer from uh, actually, as I said, lower intelligence levels. So when you're dealing with a society like Zootopia, that could actually represent where some pairings would be actively discouraged, where basically, you know, it's almost like a form of parental abuse where you're going through, you are actually bringing a individual to this world that is going to have issues. There's no way around it. And so even for species that are uh, compatible with each other, there might be things there. And one thing that uh, I mentioned in the notes here is I kind of group things up into three possibilities, compatible individuals. So once again, this is going to be your wolves and uh, you know, coyotes or you know, uh, any number of some of the horse species being able to cross different zebra species. They are 100% compatible with each other. No problem there, but also, so from a genetic standpoint, there are no issues. However, my thought is also there wouldn't be a social stigma associated with it. Why? Because it's a canine and another canine. Even though they're different species, they're a similar body type. They have uh, similar both anatomy and physiology. But as that case, there probably wouldn't be, you know, if, once again, if you did have a wolf and a coyote that were, you know, uh, living together, they were a couple there probably wouldn't be as much of an issue with it if, uh, as opposed to something like a broad cross. And even if you have something like a predator and a prey being together, once again, cultural barriers as opposed to genetic ones. Now, on the other side, of course, we have incompatible species. Once again, these are ones that they can't reproduce. Doesn't matter what you do, it's genetically in genetic incompatibility. It's not going to happen. That I could face... Yeah, well, exactly, funny, exactly. Where, unfortunately, that is a situation where, um, in this case... The societal pressure, it would only be the societal pressure on this one. And it would just be the idea of, you know, once again, the same idea that in human cultures, let's face it, uh, there's definitely is pressure on couples to have kids. Sometimes those couples don't want to have kids and they're viewed as if they've grown an extra head for by some people. So it's something where there is that idea of a stigma that you're doing this for yourselves. It's selfish, anything like that. So there would be issues there. And of course, the one that I focused on with lost causes is those that are on the edge of compatibility. The ones where there's just enough genetics for fertilization to occur, but it's so much that the ability to actually bring a viable offspring, bring you know, uh, give birth to them and have them grow, it's not going to happen. And that's actually where things get crazy. And I can actually see, once again, this idea of similar to the idea of the intellectual disability for the, you know, uh, even for some of the narrow crosses, the social stigma associated with that would probably be much, much higher. And it would probably deal, you know, when we're dealing with actual just overall development, something like that where, yeah, I can definitely see there being a complete and total social stigma associated with it, with hybrids that basically, uh, yeah, if you're not in a compatible pairing, or even if you're in an incompatible pairing, those two would probably be viewed in a better light than those that are on that fringe. The ones that if something does happen, if the female does become pregnant, they are basically doomed to tragedy. Yeah, I can see the social stigma being way larger for that. All right. So uh, I'm just trying to see here. So are there any other questions? Because Julius does have to leave shortly. So we'll start to wrap this up. Uh, once again, any questions, feel free to send me a message on Reddit. It's also ENG050599. Uh, the post for the, where all the notes, basically, I just put the individual notes up for the discussion. It's currently pinned to the top of the channel, and it will usually stay there throughout the weekend. Anything longer than that, who knows? But if you do have questions, let me know. Once again, the uh, pin messages at the top of this message board. There are actually all the other previous talks. Um, yeah, very good. Great questions. Sorry, I once again kept on talking a bit too much. I need to work more on getting more people involved in this. But yeah, it's only the second time I've done the chat. So hopefully it's all right. But yeah, does anybody want to have any questions? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, there's one here. Could 
I was going to Go answer ahead. Mark Martin say, asking yes. if he can have a cub with, say, a swift fox. I think the one he no. can have a cub with is an arctic fox, and that's yes. it. But the arctic it. fox, as far as I'm aware, wouldn't be fertile. Uh, well, once again, there's various things, and there have been reports of fertility, but it's really rare. Um, in fact, in the past, so when we're dealing with foxes, as opposed to the Canis genus, where, as I said, almost all of them have 78 chromosomes, similar body plan, similar development time, they are all matches. Volps uh, is completely different, where each of the individual species vary wildly in their chromosome counts. Uh, so, for instance, the red fox, I believe, is 17 chromosome pairs. Uh, the Fennec fox is like either 50 or 64, I don't remember. The chromosome numbers are completely different. And as a result, yeah, the pairings, uh, it's just there. And in fact, in the case of the Arctic fox, they originally classified the Arctic fox under the Alapec genus, as opposed to Volt, because they thought they're not going to be able to breed. It was only with the fur trade that, yes, hybrids were made. And that's why now uh, they changed the genus. So now uh, Arctic fox does fall under the Volps genus because they can breed. They have to be, you know, closer to that. Once again, this brings up, um, I'll just kind of we'll close things off, but uh, the war in biology is still going on between uh, basically the taxonomists and the molecular biologists. Because for the longest time, of course, how did we name species and group them? It was based on what looks similar. What has similar anatomical features? What has uh, similar size development, habitats, diet, all that? Molecular biology came along, and now, of course, we look at the genomes. And we were able to do things like say how those two are completely unrelated or entirely different genera, even though they look the same. But also from the animal side of things, it's that, yeah, these two are actually much more closer together than we thought they were. That's a, that's a good example of like how uh, taxonomy versus like actual molecular stuff. Look yep. at the entire... Uh, Leporidae. Leporidae. Uh, yeah, oh, butterflies, yes. <laughs> oh, God, that is such a horrible <sighs> mess. And once again, uh, if anybody is interested, when I talked about reproductive isolation, uh, also sometimes called mechanical isolation, look up insects, because I am not joking. Even with some of the closely related species, quite literally, insects have evolved with the parts don't fit. They physically cannot mate with each other. So, yeah, it's something they don't see that as often in species. As I said, right now, like mechanical differences in mammalian species is really something along the lines of the Great Dane and the Chihuahua. That's not going to fit. And I can only imagine, depending on which way that goes, that's possibly life threatening. <laughs> oh, so yeah, it is. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, once again, uh, when it comes to breeding many of these many of these breeds, looking back at the history of it, it basically was. Oh, yeah. Uh, just absolute torturous. And that's also the same way where, well, and once again, this gets to the idea of, uh, I have a few friends where, meeting a biologist, I've basically been completely immunized against, uh, you know, being able to talk about even the more depressing concepts. So I have a few friends that are vegan, and of course, they're like, you should do, you, you love animals, you should do this. I'm kind of like, do you realize how many species would become extinct if we didn't carry them for meat anymore? We have bred these things to such an extent that they physically cannot reproduce on their own without people oh, yeah. taking care of it. Those lines are dead. So things like, uh, one of the more famous ones, of course, turkeys. Turkeys have been bred now, where the domesticated ones, the ones that are farmed, are so big, they can't mate. The same thing happens with some of the cows, where the, uh, what we call the sexual dimorphism, so the differences between the male and female, is so big, the bulls are so freaking big, they can't mate with the cows. They have to actually use artificial insemination. Mm -hmm. So if people don't breed these things, they're going extinct immediately and that oh it's, it's one where, you know it's all it's just tragic because yes i do see the point uh it's one where i am definitely a believer that uh i do eat meat i do ask that they be raised and slaughtered in as you know as ethical a manner a quick and painless manner as you can you know this idea of that don't support and once again as, as i said being a biologist i can't be against animal testing because i just happen to know there's no viable alternative at this stage we keep working on it. I can promise anyone in the room that's looked at this, there is a lot of money going into trying to build these systems. Uh, but as I said, right now, we just don't understand enough. We know way more than we did 20 years ago. There's still a long way to go. Yeah. All right. The, the, so are, the us, sorry. Uh, no, I was going to say, so are there any, uh, said, any other questions that we want to uh, just cover before we have to go? Because yeah, once again, I know Julius is going to have to leave. So, no. No, um, firstly, okay. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, no, sorry. I'm just saying, uh, sorry. viruses. 
some viruses can cross species. Uh, there actually, if you go and look at the talk for public health, we cover this because uh, one of the absolute worst case scenarios for a pathogen spread is when you're dealing with uh, a zoonosis. So uh, either zoonosis or xenonosis, depending on what, you're, what you call it, but uh, disease in one animal being able to cross to another. And how does this happen? You have a lot of species living together in close proximity. Normally, viruses have evolved to work within a given species, but one thing to keep in mind is with diseases, the ideal situation for a pathogen is not to kill a host. You keep the host alive so that you can reproduce and make more of yourself. When you have these things where diseases jump ship, because it might be an entirely novel pathogen, the new host species has no defense against it. That's where you have a situation where suddenly you have a disease that has you know, a 50 plus percent mortality rate because it just didn't occur in the population. And yes, in Zootopia, when we deal with the public health, I said that there are probably, you know, the health authorities monitor everything. There would be immense amounts of reporting for any time somebody comes in with, you know, a disease that they are either hasn't seen or one that they have seen before. They know what's going to happen. The red flags would go up. Isolation would be in place. There would probably be far more work done to isolate, immunize. And once again, just once again, because it's a, you know, there is controversy here, even though there shouldn't be because, yeah, uh, with, you're dealing with vaccine safety. There are no personal exemptions in Zootopia, as far as I'm concerned. Why? Because the cost is way too high. You are in a situation where diseases can cross between multiple individuals. It would be continuous. And if something goes wrong, if you basically have that break in what we call sometimes a firewall, what we refer to it as, where it crosses over and either does something like goes airborne, uh, is able to infect uh, another uh, species. That's it. You can have situations where entire populations just get devastated. And by devastated, I do mean, you know, in some of these cases, for instance, uh, with some of the Ebola strains, 98% fatality rate. Mm. We are dealing with things that just naturally, and that is also a disease that's crossed over. Uh, right now, the current thought is fruit bats. There's also others that might come from primates, but it crossed over into humans. And once again, from a viral perspective, it kills the host way too fast. It's not good from a viral standpoint, but because we have no defense, there is nothing that we really have to do it. So that's why you know, some of these antibody treatments, it's good because really we didn't have anything before them. And with Ebola, uh, if anyone's ever looked at it, it is a hemorrhagic fever. It basically causes every organ and blood vessel in your body to leak. And death is normally caused either to septic shock or what we you know, just refer to as crash and bleed out. Take a wild guess what happens there. So yes, this is something where that is a nightmare scenario in Zootopia. So, oh yeah, things like, you know, either medical, even religious exemptions for vaccinations, I don't see that happening. I think they would like, like have a law against that because if anything happens, like you said, then the entire oh. economy would be, would be or bones beyond belief. Oh, exactly. That's why I think they said that uh, medical exemptions would be the only one allowed. If you're actually allergic to the vaccine or it causes effects, you're done. There is nothing else. Uh, yes, and actually, yes, the rabbit virus is there. I think it's uh, myxomytosis Ooh. is one of the most common ones for that. Uh, key thing to note with that is rabbit. Um, and once again, this one had to change in Zootopia. So actually, that disease would not be as bad in Zootopia as it is here is because uh, rabbits are obligate nasal breathers. They can't breathe through their mouths, at least not very well or for very long. So any disease that comes up and blocks the sinuses or the nasal passages like myxomytosis does, it's basically a death sentence. And yes, the disease comes in. And also, I believe there was a tick as well in Australia. I'll have to double check on that. But oh, yeah, it can come in. Entire population is dead. And because something like mitosis is an airborne virus, once it gets in there, and because with some of these rabbits, they did have warrens, just wipes them out, which in Australia was a good thing. They were trying to get rid of them. I mean, lo and behold, uh, introducing a species into a new environment where it has no natural predators and there's lots of resources for it to do. Well, we mentioned before, what happens when you have an R-type rep reproductive strategy, but K-type survival levels? That's what happens. <laughs> we look at, the, at, the, at the rabbit island in Japan, I forgot the name of yes. it. Yeah, it's almost, you see this all over the place. And oh, yeah. it is something that, yeah, basically, anytime you take a species, put it into a new environment where natural predators aren't there, but it can still find food for itself, you're going to have a population boom. Exhibit A, the lionfish in Florida. We, we Bingo! Yes! Once, once again, in Cosmo, that is a protected uh, naval environment. You are not allowed to fish, you are not allowed to hunt, except for lionfish. Kill every one of them that you see. It's the exception there. They're actually trying to make it like introduce as a diet in... Yeah, oh, I've, I've had it. It is actually very tasty. 
I thought lionfish were the ones with the poisonous spines. Really. They are, but uh, it's, it's only in the spine, so you just cut them off. It's actually, it's very similar to a whitefish, so uh, rel relatively mild, nice and firm, and uh, makes a really great, uh, just uh, so take a piece, of, yeah, take, take a fillet, batter it, and then sandwich. Really good. Huh. All right. All right, so I think that's going to be about it. Um, Yes, thank you everybody for showing up. And once again, I will check on this. I do have to run some errands now, which is why I usually just run off, but Julius also has to leave. So thank you for everybody. I'll put a post up in a little while to talk about the next one. I'm going to try and do this on kind of a monthly basis from now going on forward. Uh, I think the next one, as I'll put it up, we'll do another vote. Previously, the answer was, uh, I was gonna talk about drug discovery and basically pharmacology and medicine. And the big question, of course, what do you do when the lab rats are sentient? Because how do you test these things? All right. So thank good. you very much, everybody. I would, um, think, I would think there'd be more, a bit more talk about, say, baby care here and uh, maybe. Oh, sorry. And that well, kind of thing, because I've just been reading Guardian Blue and we've got past the oh. bunch. All right. Well, what I can do is I can definitely add on. I have no problem revisiting tar topics as well, because yeah, yes, I focus I more on. Yeah. 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 You you focus more on the scientific. Yes. I'm more <laughs> interested in the social as well as other things. So well, actually, if, and if anybody would like to host something involved in this, because yes, I will fully admit, I'm a scientist, the social aspects of this, not overly familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, so if anybody... The social aspects more theorizing, because yeah, in my of course. mind, if Nick has a baby, he'd be grabbing it by the scruff of its neck to keep <laughs> it quiet if he was, was crying. Or maybe yeah. they'd have things where they hang them up on the side, yeah. instead of well, exactly. throwing them into things. But Oh yeah, like, again, that's that's what can... Behavior's like scrapping. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but it, that's more headcanon discussing rather yeah. than science. So I can understand why we didn't get that here. All right. No problem. But yes, and obviously, if anybody does have topics, just let me know. And I will try to uh, do this a bit more frequently and well as just reach out for individual ideas. But once again, any mm -hmm. questions, even relating to something else, in particular for authors or artists, um, I've really been enjoying over the last two years being able to help people do this, you know, to plot out things to make it. I can't do realistic, but I can make it as close to reality as I can. So, once again, thank you, everybody, and have a good day. Yeah. Right. Wonderful. Sure